I'm going to call into session this meeting of the Farmington Area School Board. Please uh, rise and help uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item of the agenda is to approve the agenda. Um, the agenda has been posted online. I think all board members should have had a chance to review. Are there any items that needed to be added or any changes to the agenda? No. Seeing none, can I get a motion to pass the agenda? So moved. Second. second. Motion by Saucer, second by Carrero. All in favor say aye. 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 We have an agenda. Uh, next item on the agenda is good news and superintendent update. Uh, superintendent Berg. Uh, thank you, Chair Christensen, uh, members of the board, members of the community. Um, not quite a long list this week or this this month, which is is good because we're coming back um, in two weeks with another business meeting, and a lot of the stuff that I was going to share actually takes place after that. A lot of the things going on in the elementary, so there'll be a little bit more then. Uh, really excited to share that an FHS 12th grader. Reese Anderson received the University of St. Thomas Schultz Scholarship. So this is a super cool scholarship. It is full tuition at the University of St. Thomas for four years. So you're looking at approximately $200,000 plus in academic money. Wow. So, and she she's part of MinCAPS and um, the MinCAPS program is a partnership that we have with, um, with Prior Lake that um, does some different type of experiences based on mentorship. They have a couple of different pathways and things like that. This is actually the fifth min capper that's received this scholarship and the second FHS student. So uh, Xander Schmaby received it a couple of years ago. Um, and so what, what, what this entails, obviously the money's a big deal, but also um, she's gonna have access to the highly competitive Schultz Innovation Program, which only admits 10 freshmen each year. So this 10 person cohort is able to supplement their education at St. Thomas through additional educational experiences such as individual mentors, hands-on projects, and access to networking and internships. And then the really cool thing too is that when they finish, if they have a startup idea, they'll also give them seed capital for that. So a really cool honor for one of our, our um, high school students that's part of our program and also part of MinCAPS. Uh, the Minnesota State High School League speech tournament took place over the weekend. We had one person. Uh, partake in the AA uh, event at Eastview. So 10th grader Ronan Gruel qualified, performed really well, but didn't make it out of those qualifying um, uh, preliminary rounds. So hats off to, to him on, on that performance. Um, FHS, and I know Kenny's going to talk a little bit more about this, but FHS hosted the South Suburban Jazz Festival last Thursday. And the only thing I'll say about that is it's, it's been since 2019 since um, that festival has taken place. So it was cool to have that um, going on again, you know, over 10 schools, had the, had, had the chance to go walk around, listen to some rehearsals and listen to performance is really neat opportunity. Uh, the fall play took uh, place over the weekend. Kenny's gonna talk a little bit more about that, but I just wanted to give a shout out to the cast, crew and directors of Radium Girls. Heard it was awesome. Um, Rogue Robotics was at the Worlds. So this giant robotic competition, literally from all over the world. I think their first competition was against a team from China. So there was 450 um, plus teams. There was 76 teams in their division. They ended up with four wins and six losses. So they didn't make it out of qualifying stages, but they ended the tournament with the win and by their social media presence, looks like they had a great time, uh, not only competing, but partaking in the other things that Houston had available uh, to them. The FHS Choir Department has their ninth annual cabaret next Saturday, April 30th. They have show times at three o'clock and seven o'clock. And you do need tickets for that. And if you're interested, if you go to www.farmingtonchoir.com, you can get tickets. And if you haven't been to that before, that is super cool because Kids put on all sorts of different acts and you don't you, to see the traditional choir concerts that we sing. It is a performance and it is something to behold. Uh, the i just give a quick legislative session update. We are in the final month. Uh, both E-12 supplemental budget bills have gone through their committees in the House and the Senate. Now they go onto the floor. Once those bills are approved by each body, then the conference committees are gonna hash those out um, and reconcile any differences. The differences are uh, quite stark. I believe the Senate bill uh, allocates about 30 million for 
E12, and then the house is 1.1 billion. So they're a little bit off on those two things. Um, and, 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 and I mentioned this before, but I just wanted to mention this piece of advocacy again. The biggest thing that's impacting school districts are the cross subsidies. I mean, it, we get money on the funding formula, that's great. But for a district like Farmington, if we get 1%, that's about $500,000. Unfortunately, our special ed cross subsidy is projected to grow between three and, and $400,000 next year. So that doesn't even, they're, they're not keeping up with what their promise was. Our cross subsidy is about $8.1 million. State of Minnesota, it's about $570 million. They have the money to take care of that. That would be about 8% of that surplus, and, and that would be the financial fix that, that schools would really need. So hopefully they'll come to some terms. There, there seems to be some traction around um, taking care of those cross-subsidies, but that would move us from being you know, in a projected $4 million deficit to a $4 million surplus, and our conversations would be uh, much different. And then finally, I just want to thank uh, Board Member Saucer again. I'd, Gave a little bit of speech, but now that this is on video for prosperity's sake, just want to thank her for her um, three terms of service. Um, you know, hopefully we have other members that will make it three terms, but I know that the, the pressures and the strains that board members are on, that's that's becoming more and more difficult. So to serve a community for that long is, is very commendable. Um, as I said, your commitment to the aspirational part of a strategic plan really helped us drive and change over the past 10 years and really become a leader around student-centered learning. I know Chris and Lisa and Rick and Carrie are gonna talk a little bit where we are, but the number of school districts that have visited or asked us to come and share over the past 10 years is really an out, out, out piece of that, that aspirational nature. So I wanna thank you for that support. And then that really student-centered focus. I know that is a, a passion of yours and, and something that, a lens that you've always looked through and not only serving us, but serving 917 as well. And I'm certain you will find ways to continue to serve um, in your new districts as well. So I will end by saying thank you for the time and the support, especially the last two years. That is it, Chair Christensen. All right. Thank you, Superintendent Berg. Um, our next item is the student school board update. Michael and Kennedy, do you want to do a coin toss or do you have you decided who wants to go first? We got it. Hi everyone, quite a few things have happened in Farmington since our last update. Unfortunately, with the crazy weather we have in Minnesota, um, a lot of outdoor sports like baseball and softball have had their games um, postponed or canceled. This is very sad for our athletes, but it gives them more opportunity to train and hopefully win state again. All right. As Mr. Burke had mentioned, FHS just put on a play called Radium Girls. There was three total showings. It was about some women in the 1920s who worked in a factory that gave them diseases due to complications of radium and their battle to fight the company. For the seniors, it was their very last show with Farmington, and it was, that was a lot of fun to see. I had the chance to speak with Director Brillen about the play, and she states, it's a show that was consistently done really well by the students, and we had no real mess ups in any of the performances. That's unique. <laughs> <laughs> Friday, April 22nd was Earth Day. FCCLA, FCCLA, a volunteer chapter at our school, participated in an Earth Day cleanup. They traveled to Lake Julia after school to pick up trash and things that did not belong from the park and lake. They endured the wet conditions from the heavy rainfall that occurred that morning. Farmington Student Council is currently running elections for their new executive board. The president and vice president have already been decided. Junior Abigail Radeski has been elected president for next year, and I've been elected vice president for our council the following year. I've also been elected vice president for the capital division for the council in our area. It's really great to see the council grow and expand to new people, and I really hope to extend Farmington's reach. Current 8th through 11th graders, applications for council will come out within the next month, so make sure to check your Schoology for updates. On Wednesday, April 13th, many students gathered together before school at a signing ceremony held by our athletic director, Mr. Badger. It was really cool to see these seniors take their athletic journey to the next level because they were recognized for it. In efforts to create a safe space for all students at our school, during the month of Ramadan, our school provides a couple different resources to Muslim, Muslim students. Firstly, we have two conference rooms that are designated to, to be prayer spaces if needed. Secondly, there are two no food zones during lunches in Mr. Grove and Mr. Mead's room at the high school, so that our Muslim students do not need to be around food while they are fasting. All of this is an effort to create those safe spaces for every learner at Farmington. Finally, there were some events held at the high school recently. There was the Middle School Band Festival. This event had middle schoolers from all around the area come to the high school and play for a day. I personally didn't see any of the performances, but some of my friends did, and they said it was truly a fun experience to see these kids play. There was also the South Suburban Com Jazz Conference, which was, sorry, there was also the South Suburban Conference Jazz Festival, 
which some high schoolers participated in. Thank you. Um, on, in my news, um, the day every junior has been fearing this entire year has finally come to pass. The ACT took place this last week on April 19th. Everyone is as excited to be done with it as they were stressed <laughs> about, it, about taking it. And we should be expecting results in about two to five weeks, depending on when they get to grade eight. Um, track and field news. Track has their first varsity meet at Hopkins and a JV meet at Eastview tomorrow. Um, the weather looks better than it has for the last couple weeks. So hopefully, they're, and with less schools competing, hopefully we won't have a freezing six hour meet this week. And the lights will stay on. Hopefully. <laughs> Um, with April coming to a close, that means that AP tests are coming up. Um, for those unfamiliar with AP classes, there are co college level courses taught through the school with an exam at the end to determine if the student receives college credit. Um, this May, the culmination of the year, of the previous year, and the review of the previous year is in full swing. Um, I just want to say good luck to all AP students planning on taking the test, and also good luck to all the parents during the review process, as it can be quite a stressful time. Now, with the end of, also with the end of April, students are gearing up for the last 28 days of school, and you can truly feel the excitement building. It's very easy for some students, for most students, to let some work slip through the cracks. Luckily, teachers who have been at this for multiple years, who are, who are expecting the lull and working hard, are, are working hard keeping us moving. And finally, prom is 12 days away, and you can already feel the excitement in the junior and senior classes. With prom free season in full swing, it's now the last call to get a dress or rent a tux, both of which are in quite limited supply, which I learned personally last week when I was renting the tux. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's my update. Awesome. Thank you so much. I guess I'm lucky I don't have to rent a tux anytime soon. <laughs> uh, our next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda is made up of routine business items that can be acted upon with one motion. If any board member wishes to discuss an item, they may request it be pulled from the consent agenda and it will be acted upon separately. Does anyone have an item they wish to discuss? Seeing none, can I have a motion to uh, pass the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Motion by Carrero, second by Saucer. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, the consent agenda is passed. Moving on, uh, we'll move into reports and communications. Uh, first item up is competency-based learning overview with uh, Chris Busman, Lisa Edwards, Carrie Benton, and Rick Yonker. Good evening, Chair Christensen and members of the board. We are very excited to be here. I'm sure you are excited to hear for Director Busman and I, but I also want to introduce our stars of the show tonight, and these are our <coughs> colleagues. Kiri Benton is our District Literacy Coordinator, and then we have Rick Yonker, who's our District Science and Technology Specialist. But they both hold the title of also being personalized learning coaches within our district as well. So they are definitely going to be speaking quite a bit and sharing all the great things they've learned as well through the years. So let's start a little bit with competency-based education and go back to our why and where it started, how it happened. Um, and actually, it happened probably seven or eight years ago. There was groups of teachers that really were struck by our district's strategic plan at the time about, com um, about personalized learning. How are we really gonna engage all of our learners, all the way from our struggling learners, providing experiences even for our highest learners and engaging them all day um, in high level thinking. How can we provide that for all of them? And so um, gr these groups of teachers came and what they discovered is they discovered web steps of the knowledge and they discovered competency-based education and they started to dig into it and they wanted to bring it to our district. And that's kind of when our teaching and learning department started to get involved and help support it. And so we're just here supporting the wants and needs of our teachers who are trying to provide the best possible learning environment for all of our learners. Um, and in, the, uh, in that last slide, it kind of talked about we are really organic. So it's really coming from the teachers. This was not a top-down program or something that we're bringing in. It really is coming from the ground up and it's something that they want based on the needs of our learners in the district. Um, and so here's kind of the history. It, like, it stems all out of that strategy three with that personalized learning and giving that agency to all of our learners within the district. And the three big pieces of that are competency-based education, which means that we then had to learn how to build these competencies and rubrics, which is what our teaching and learning department kind of took on that process of really understanding how to build that and bringing that in for our teachers for them to start building 
the, their own rubrics within our district, and then Web's depth of knowledge. And then the lighter pink circles are just the other pieces uh, to help support that competency-based learning. Um, talking about learner agency, now we had knowledge works coming in to help support us, um, launch cycle and inquiry, and then learner profiles. And really, our work with this um, has been a little bit on pause over the last few years. Um, we're gearing back up for it, doing a lot more with it. But before that, we had really been digging into it um, at nationwide. So we've been working with other districts and state education departments on competency-based education, bringing some of that knowledge back. We presented at national conferences about our process so others could learn from us. And then we've presented across the state multiple times. We have had so many districts come and visit us, as um, Mr. Or Superintendent Berg said earlier, too, um, that we have quite a few districts coming to visit us even in the next couple of weeks, wanting to see what we're doing with competencies. And throughout the last few years, it started small with a small group of teachers. We built um, our probably our language arts ones mm -hmm. first, K through 12. And now it's grown that most of our secondary, especially our middle schools, have really dug into competencies and have built it for most of the subject areas. And so we are just providing what our teachers want um, to provide for all of our students. Yeah, and one of the things that I can add on to that is, and you'll hear uh, Jason Berg talk a lot about that, we are not initiative driven, where we come up with this idea and concept and then we come up with like a two year plan to have everybody implement this piece. Uh, that organic part of it was there were people who took some big risks in the learning that was going about and then the application. And then as more and more people started to become um, aware of what that was looking like, they were starting to implement that in. And so it's been kind of a slow phase in of this process, but it's gained a lot of momentum. People have seen a lot of the value. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about some things around grading and reporting. And even prior to a lot of this stuff that was happening uh, at the middle level, we spent a lot of time back in probably 12 years ago, 13 years ago, really rethinking what it was that was part of a student's grade. And there were things that were part of grades at that time that had nothing to do with learning. Things that were about, um, did you bring in a couple of Kleenex boxes? Did you uh, incorporate um, fees as part of a course? So just a lot of things and even behavior, a lot of those soft skills that didn't have anything to do with learning. And so this was really a big shift in thinking about how do we um, truly um, engage our learners in what that learning looks like. And even though things have been slowed down for us maybe here um, at the district level for the last few years, at the federal level, it is still moving. And just recently there was legislation passed that was offering competitive grants for states for new assessments. And the two priorities were that they had to have assessments with multiple measures. And then the second is that it had to be aligned in a competency-based education model. So even the federal government is starting to look towards ways to help support this competency-based education. And we're starting to see more and more states also um, taking the competency education. So in here it shows you which ones have no policies all the way up to which ones are advanced. And the Department of Education here in Minnesota is starting to dip their toes in it as well. It says that we're in the developing um, state and I know that they're even trying to create uh, a separate part of the department for competency-based education. And we can't wait to start partnering with them because there have been other districts we've worked within the state of Minnesota around this competency-based. So we're very excited to see this spreading because we have just seen it, the power of it with our own students and then even with our teachers as well. And so we're very excited about competency-based education. We wanted to make sure that you maybe understood just a little bit more of the basics of that. And that's why Rick and Carrie are here is to kind of present some of the things that we do for teachers is, too. Can I ask a quick question? And do you mind if we ask questions throughout or do you want us to wait until the end? I just wanted to, I don't want to mess up your flow. No, no that's okay. Are we, uh, is Farmington going to be eligible for those, for, for grants? Uh, is grants? Grant. Okay, so, so the state of Minnesota needs to apply. Oh, okay, so we need the state to, okay, got it. it it's part of the state accountability system. Yeah. So they, one of the things that's come out of the federal government is instead of just saying the county system right now is not maybe showing or reflective, let's change it. They're trying to get states to do it. And so that is one of the things that I've advocated with with MDE is that you need to go after this. Because if you look at the governor's supplemental bill, there's actually, this is the first time to Lisa's point that they've set aside money for competency-based learning professional development and for their organization. To, they have one person that's responsible for student-centered learning of that whole division to actually create additional people as well. So okay. 
So the the state would get the money. The state would get the money to they redo might apply it to yeah. the rest of districts or something. Yeah, like that, and, and the idea would be to look at instead of what the MCAs currently look like. Right. The thought would be to move to more of a performance based assessment um, based on these different things that they're going to share about. Okay, thanks. Um, so good evening. Um, Rick and I are really excited to be here to share with you some of the things that we've been working on as a teaching and learning department. Um, and as Lisa mentioned, um, one of the things that we started with was something called Webb's Depth of Knowledge, or DOK. And really what that means, it's just the degree or complexity of knowledge that um, learners need in their learning. And one of the things that we did to start is Rick and I um, facilitated, facilitated a staff development session and we went to each building and kind of shared out what depth of knowledge really meant and what it meant and what it might look like in their classrooms and in their teaching. Or well, good evening, it's just a great honor to be here. Like <clears throat> Carrie and Lisa and Chris said, uh, we're super excited to be here. People that know me are like, you, Rick, you're pretty much always excited, which is true. Uh, but I'm super excited because I got my teaching license in 1987. And I can just honestly say there's, there hasn't been a more exciting time for me as I look at kind of the latter part of my career of investing and supporting and connecting with learning. And kind of the backstory to Webb's depth of knowledge is that long before we were here and talking about competencies, uh, Zach Howard and I, in the, when, when I was a biology teacher, we wanted to increase uh, the rigor of what we were doing. We didn't want it to just be merely about content. And so we started digging into Webb's depth of knowledge. And so Carrie and I kind of independently became Webb's depth of knowledge geeks. And uh, Jason was my principal at the time, and he was just like, go for it. And so uh, this is really became the foundation for uh, understanding and and it's really the, the research and the background to, to why competencies are so significant to us, so. Right, so the next slide you'll see is um, Bloom's taxonomy versus DOK. And Bloom's taxonomy just really is another hierarchical ordering of skills that teachers can use in their classrooms. Um, this is not for us to say that, you know, Bloom's is bad and DOK is good. They're just very different. Um, and the big differences are is that Bloom's more focuses on the tasks and the verbs, which we'll kind of go over in just a minute. Um, whereas DOK really focuses on cognitive demands that our students or our learners are using, and then their thinking processes. So yeah, so some verbs here, and this, this is just helpful again, a lot of uh, when you think of how many, many teachers, uh, including myself, uh, went through Bloom's, it was real significant and we've used in, in, in many contexts, but one of the challenges, of course, is the verbs, uh, and that the verbs uh, can mean a lot of different things and they can really represent different uh, cognitive demands on the learning context, so. Right, so you can see that in this example, um, the word describe is used three different times, or three different situations, um, but in those situations, there's very different um, cognitive rigor in the first one, it's just simple recall. So it's basically just memorizing information. In the second one, um, that requires a little bit more cognitive processing because you have to determine the differences between um, those different kinds of rocks. And in the third example, which has more cognitive rigor than the other ones, um, that requires deep understanding of the rock cycle. And that's kind of where we want our learners to be um, working are in those high cognitive demand experiences, um, which can be a challenge mm -hmm. for some students because they may not be used to that, but um, that's where the creative juices really flow once we're working in those levels. So Webb's depth of knowledge looks at, at, at four levels and it isn't level one and two really are focused around recall, memorization, those types of <clears throat> Uh, strategies and one of the things is Carrie and I have talked with uh, teachers, buildings, other districts as well is you, you really need level one and two. It mm -hmm. isn't about uh, skipping over level one and two. But what we found is that we looked at if we did like a kind of a, an audit, like what are what am I teaching as a biology teacher? Like what percentage of my uh, learning experience is is built around a level one and two opportunity? And as I talked with teachers in our district and other districts and even nationally, 
it's interesting, like a very high percentage, like better than 50%, maybe 60, 70% often falls onto level one and two. And the, and the truth is, is that level one and two, as important as it is, and in fact, that's kind of an area that we typically get tested on, isn't, isn't, there's really not much rigor involved. There's really not an opportunity to give learners the, the optimum context for growing and learning and developing uh, as learners. And so you really, in, in level three and four, we're like an add on an extra, like if we get to it, we might apply it. If we get to it, we might have opportunity for application when really that should be woven into the whole context of learning. That's really the heart of competency is it says, look, this significant aspect of learning is built into the fabric of what we do as educators. Right, so, and like Rick mentioned, not everything can be done at those levels three and four, no. but we do need to make sure that we're providing learning experiences for our students so they are working at those levels. And, yeah. and just to interrupt just real quick, and if you think about to your educational experience, and think about the tests you took in high school, and I was guilty of this when I taught math, where were they, right? We spent a lot of time in recall and skills and concepts. And again, you need those things. And so part of the piece that led us to how do we design learning better and engage people is we need to, to, to get organized in a way to move from one and two to three and four in an easier fashion. And that's really kind of where, when Chris and Lisa talked about teachers coming to us, because they started to try to get to that, and they're like, well, this is really hard with the way the standards are written. This is really hard with this. How can we repackage it mm -hmm. so that it's easier to move through those? So. Right, and it's not about the teachers recreating and getting rid of what they've already done. It's about thinking what they're doing and how do we get that, the complexity of thinking um, to those higher three and four levels. And, and sometimes it's just some sw small tweaks that the teachers make in their lessons and units. You may, um, maybe you'll get to this, but a, kind of a question I get is like, how are competencies decided or how are they determined? Is that, is that in, okay. Yep. It just seemed like also a dovetail into this, so maybe it's the next slide, I don't know. Yeah, no, yeah, no, this is coming. Actually, it's coming. Gonna be, yeah. After okay. we get through web step of knowledge and understanding right. that, we're gonna show you the process that we go through to develop competencies. Yeah, and it, Thanks, but a good question, it, come, it really comes out of this, uh, this notion, and so, one, one piece that really helped us and helped mm -hmm. others support understanding uh, Webb's DOK or Webb's depth of knowledge was just this notion of difficult versus complex. Are they the same? Are they different? And really, they're actually very different. And so sometimes, as we would work with the design of learning experiences in the classrooms, uh, look at, you know, what are we doing to increase rigor? And some people would interpret rigor as maybe adding, you know, an extra worksheet or more math problems or whatever. Uh, but it was really just making it more difficult, not complex. And so one example is, you know, if I were to ask you or anyone here, do you know the definition of exaggerate? You know, many, many people would, you know, put their hand up. I know that. Yep, I know the definition of it. And then I would say, well, do you know the definition of prescient? And the people are just like, you know, very few people would know that. And I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. But would that make them understanding that term, is that more uh, complex? Well, no, it's just difficult. And so many times the attempt at getting at higher levels of rigor or higher levels of cognitive demand ended up being simply increasing difficulty versus complexity. And so I think part of our work in supporting and coaching the design of learning is, 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 is working with and understanding the differences between the two. And that's where Webb's depth of knowledge shines because it really supports that. It really gives us a way to scaffold uh, the, the creation and the design of learning experiences that, that optimize opportunities for learners. And, and, and you need to be very careful when people in education talk about increasing the rigor. The question has to be, what does that look like? Because yep. to what Rick was talking about, and again, I was a math teacher, horrible at this, like long division is long division, <laughs> right? The process is the same we would add rigor to that by putting decimal points or fractions and things like that. The process is the same. That, that's, that's, that's not any more complex, right? How am I gonna use that information is gonna be complex, but in education, this idea of rigor has really been, I think, skewed because ultimately what people are talking about is they've just made it difficult. They haven't made it more complex and they haven't made people think deeper. They've just made it harder, so. Or an example, just giving more math problems. Yeah, you're same. good at math, there's more <laughs> yeah. for you. Yeah. <laughs> so we can think of DOK um, in terms of game shows. 
So this, this really clarified for me kind of what the DOK levels are. If you think of the game show Jeopardy or even Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, we think of those people as being very, very smart, right? And they are, but when you bring it down to the lowest levels, really what they're doing is memorize, they're really good at memorizing facts, right? Um, and then we can go to something like, I'll have you, can you, there we go, thank you. <laughs> um, something like Shark Tank, where, um, somebody is creating a product um, and bringing it from the beginning ideas all the way to um, its creation, that takes a lot of high level um, thinking and complexity. And that's really at those three and four levels when you're talking about strategic and extended thinking. And these are the kind of opportunities or learning experiences that we wanna make sure our students have more of. So when we think about competencies, and Lisa had mentioned, you know, the opportunities that came together when a group of teachers, and again, I was a part of that group of teachers that were looking at, you know, how do we grow in personalized learning? Like we, several of us wrote a grant, we got a grant from the state of Minnesota, we were able to connect with school districts across the nation, including um, in those in Wisconsin and other places. And what came out of that was, you know, the, you know, how do we do this, and, and it became, True, true to us, at least, the competencies and using competencies was a big part of that. And so Rose Colby has been a big part of supporting that. Here's a book that she wrote, which has a lot of the research around competencies. And she is an amazing person. She's very brilliant. She works nationally with many people. And she's actually helped support us many times by conversations personally with her in Farmington. One activity that I do, uh, and I talk to uh, teachers about this, is, you know, I taught biology at Farmington High School for many years, and I say that, you know, when I have students come back and talk to me, and I, I love that when, hey, Mr. Y or Mr. Yonker, thank you for, for being my teacher, and I tell them that in all the times when they've come back and talked to me, never once have they come back and said, Mr. Y, thank you for teaching me the process of mitosis. <laughs> uh, but they often talk about opportunities to engage in science at a higher level, and so I kind of took that and I asked teachers, and we've used other ways of phrasing this activity, but what three science concepts and skills would you want all learners uh, to, to be able to demonstrate by the time they leave your classroom building and when they graduate? And so I just started compiling this list from teachers that I worked with at the Minnesota Science Teachers Association and other buildings, including our district and, and other districts. So here's some of the responses that we got uh, from teachers. What do they want for all their learners? And this is just a small sampling of answers. But what I learned through this, and I knew intuitively from my own research and experience as a teacher, is that in the long run, our main aim is not to make content experts, but to grow our, our learners as scientists and as high-level thinkers. And it, and it just became evident through many, many conversations with others. And when I share this, people are like, yeah, we want that too. We know that this is what we want. We want all our learners to be there. And I'm like, well, what you're saying then is you want competencies because this is really the heart of competencies, being able to apply knowledge in a real world context. So what are competencies? It's the ability of students to take that information and use strategic or extended thinking and apply it and apply their knowledge to achieve a purpose that has meaning in the world and you can see the connection to DOK, and it's helping learners move from DOK 1 and 2 to DOK 3 and 4. Can you just touch on the differences between strategic and extended um, and how that looks different when you're working with teachers? So extended thinking is really connected more to applying it. Strategic would be, in my mind at least, uh, you know, a specific design for that learning. Okay. Uh, and, and I would say extended thinking is really just more applying it. Thanks. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. It's really about students creating, right? Right. That's what we want them to be yep. doing. Exactly. So when we're thinking about um, competencies and personalized learning, what we're finding is that the, the two merge very well together. And so why have we been talking about competencies so much? Um, one, it really um, 
makes teachers stop and think about the complexity of the learning experiences, so those higher DOK levels. It really takes the focus off of those isolated tasks um, and assignments, like maybe more worksheets instead of creating um, and designing. Um, and then um, they're actually applying those skills, right? They're not just, again, writing something on a worksheet, they're actually designing something. And then again, the application of knowledge, um, and it gives a per, uh, that for them to achieve a purpose that has meaning in the real world, it's more authentic. So they can see why they're learning something. It's not just why are you having me do this. This shows students, so this is why it's applicable in the real world. And if you think back to about, I think it's been about 2015 when Mr. Miller was principal at Bachman and I was at Dodge, we went through a, a two to three year process with our community on really coming up with a whole new um, student framework for experiences because we were on, I think, like an eight period day and we said we wanted to go to something that was going to facilitate kind of this change in what learning would look like. So that's what we, that was kind of the impetus behind moving to those 90 minute blocks. Mm -hmm. At that same time, one of the things that we did is we did an, uh, an analysis of what was the experience of a sixth grader like. And at that time, we were on quarters, about 44 days uh, per quarter. And we found that of the classes that we had at that time, um, over 44 days, we were asking a sixth grader to produce 117 pieces of evidence that was graded and put into the grade book, right? Now, if you think about an adolescent brain, 117 might seem like a little bit of a stretch. Then we took a look at what those tasks were, and they were all very low level um, one and two. And so that's where a lot of the change came to say, how can we really provide this extended amount of time um, that would allow our, our teachers and our learners to really engage in some things. And so the volume of things really came down quite a bit and it allowed students the opportunity um, to have multiple access points into what that learning would look like. And I think Chair Christensen, this should more answer your, the question that you had earlier kind of what is the difference between those standards versus competencies and how do we get to competencies? Um, the competencies are built using the standards. So it's not something we're just pulling out of the air randomly. They, they do go back to the standards. Um, and this is, again, some of the differences that um, you will be able to see when working with standards versus competencies. In standards, we're more talking about the delivery of content. Um, it's got a lower depth of knowledge oftentimes. It's more teacher focused and it's kind of a one and done opportunity. When we're looking at competencies, um, this is really about allowing students to apply and transfer the things that they're learning across multiple content areas. Um, it is a higher order demand because you're constantly thinking about when I'm providing this experience, am I having my students work at those higher levels? Um, it is aligned to the standards, like I said, um, and it is very learner and learner focused. So it's about the student, not what the teacher is, is kind of providing, but what can the students do and create themselves. And then the other thing is it provides multiple, multiple opportunities. It's not a one and done situation because we need to make this about the learning, not about a grade, right? We want to make sure that our students are learning whatever opportunities or experiences that we're providing instead of what grade am I going to get at the end of the day. So can I oversimplify? I mean, I want to make sure I'm, I'm following along, right? So standards, um, when you're saying standards, are you also thinking what I'm thinking, like the state standards, correct. right? Mm -hmm. yeah, just, correct. Important question and, and a dumb question, maybe, but I wanted no, to make sure I asked. No, it. not at that's all. That's good. Yeah. And, and then, so then do you think of that as say, so you've got state level standards and now we're translating if the standards are about how the state tells teachers what to do, then the competencies are uh, like a layer of translation into day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month. They're putting it, so standards are very much like a list of skills that mm -hmm. the students need to do. And that's where standards are that low-level thinking. Um, now, they are rewriting standards. As they rewrite the standards, like the science, they are more competency-like than they were standards. So there's an evolution going on there's across both. There's definitely an evolution okay. going on. And so what I'll share with you is like, so on the left side, there is the I can statements, which is what teachers usually build off of their competencies. And as you can see, it's a list. And this is about how to find meanings of unknown words. So I can use a dictionary. I can use Latin uh, prefixes and suffixes. I can do this. And what happens is our teachers 
are testing and assessing each one of those, right? They're spending class time every day to make sure that every student 100, gets 100% of being able to use context clues and 100% being able to use a dictionary. Mm -hmm. But really, as an adult, does it matter if you know every single one of those skills to 100% proficiency? Absolutely not. The main thing is that we want our students to be able to find the meanings of unknown words. And we have a toolbox <coughs> that we can choose that based on what we need as our own individual learner. And that's the heart of personalized learning. So what this does is it takes that list of skills and that's where we built the competencies. And we only have about four to six competencies it, for a whole year in each of our subject areas. And it takes that pressure off teachers because we still, we're still teaching all of those, right? We have sure. to give those tools to our students, but we're not assessing on each one of those and making sure they're right on with each one. We just wanna make sure that they're able to use whatever tools work for them to achieve this competency. And that's the heart of it. And that's what we're going for. Because then they're applying it, they're using it, they're creating it. And like we said, they're, you know, you might be using a combination of those tools. And so that just pulls us away from worksheets, standardized tests, and moves into that competency application. Yeah. And can the, we really use it? The other metaphor I hear here is, you know, the way I approach my work and my day job is not worrying about how we get to a place, but really thinking about the objective. Yep. So I, there, I, can, I can approach a marketing exercise lots of different ways, but what I really care about is the objective. Yep. And then I, you know, then it's, you know, situation based, you know, yeah. audience and other types of things that will get you there. So it's not just one. Because what if your boss told you right. you had to use this only this way to achieve that objective, and you had to do it perfectly? So you've you worked know? for my former boss. Okay, got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Thank the I, so I think the other thing too in the name, right? I mean, when you hear if if somebody says you're competent at something, you're you may not be a master at that, right? But you're you're good enough to do it. You know, I always use it when I go to the, with these guys. I always use the analogy of driving, right? You know, when you're when you you get some of you have been there, some of you're going to get there. You know, when your kids go take the driver's license test, you're like, oh my gosh, I hope they get this thing, right? You know, and so my I took my kid to Red Wing the first time, and the person comes back and he's got this look on his face. I'm like, oh my gosh, he failed. I got to drive him around again. I can't take this anymore. And the guy came back. He said, well, he can, he. He, I'm going to pass him, right? Which means he's competent, but he still had to practice like the 90 degree back turn, right? And there's all, there's other skills within that that are valuable, but may not may not um, may not be a huge part of you being able to drive or not, right? I mean, we ask how many people parallel park, right? My my, my wife is blank years old, and she has not <laughs> parallel parked since she got her driver's test, right? So, but but she's still competent to do that, and in. And it is possible to even be competent in something and still have to continue to work on it and stuff. And so it gets to that, the ability to, to do something. Now, there's also opportunities, and I'll stop. I, I told him I wasn't going to talk, and I was talking to this. But there's also opportunities for, for people to go and do something well within this too, right? When it, it makes sense for them and chooses for them. So, sorry. So Thank are you. there connections then between competency within the skills and by that I mean I hear parents saying what is this common core and why does my kid have to demonstrate how they used this they got the right answer is is there is there an expectation I guess on teachers that each of these skills you still have to make sure that kids know how to do that skill in particular can you can you kind of Tell, talk to us about the connection and yeah, that so way. Going back to that sixth grade example, right? What we talked about is it doesn't mean that all of these things that we're engaging our learners in, um, in digging into isn't valuable and isn't in many cases necessary as part of the competency. It's just that we don't have to spend an inordinate amount of time tracking all of it and then following up on when they don't have it, don't turn it in. Um, or aren't able to produce it. And so the, the other reality about standards, if anybody's ever really dug into the, all the Minnesota state standards, is I think that they oftentimes say you need about the equivalent of about two years per grade level to actually attempt to accomplish that. Because there's just so many. You know, if you take a look at that, and there are districts that go after standards-based grading and they attempt to produce information on every one of them. And the feedback that we got when we went through a lot of those explorations is that it's unmanageable. You know, and for many cases, it wasn't meaningful at all either. You know, but but to your to your question about like like the idea of the thought process, that's it, it, you may not have to show your thought process on everything, but 
the ability to share your thought process is essential to this because it gets to the level of thinking that that they're looking for, right? If, if I have somebody explain to me how they did something, I can start to see what connections have they made and probably more importantly, what misconceptions that they have so that we can intervene with those misconceptions. And it happens in math a lot, right? You have kids that are younger and really good at math, but they've never made the connections of how those numbers work. And so when they get to upper level math classes, all of a sudden they're not any good at math anymore. Well, it's not that they're not good. Their, their thinking was never examined to see where potentially misconceptions were or they made the, the wrong connections in there or they never made any connections. And then when they really have to dig into that, they, they can't do it. So that list that Lisa had up there of all those things, mm -hmm. they're not gonna dig into all of those, but what they're gonna do is probably ensure that kids have two or three or four of those that are mm -hmm. go-to, that if it's, if it's really difficult, they can do it. And the other thing too is, you know, we do it in math a lot too. We'll give kids multiple ways to do long division. Now, some of them are, are really effective, but take a lot of time. We also try to move them to a more efficient model, but sometimes it's, this is just the best form. It's gonna take them a lot of time. So that thinking piece is huge. That's helpful, thanks. Yeah. So I want to give you an example of what uh, one of our middle school science competencies looks like and then the rubric that was built to support this. And so when we think back over the past five to seven years, um, there were a lot of different ways that people went about um, deciding upon competencies and then writing rubrics around it. In some cases, they were done in isolation where you might have an individual teacher. Um, in other cases, it was a particular building department. And in some cases, it was, it was all teachers at a particular grade level that had voice in it. Um, what I will say is that to get to what you see here is lots and lots and lots of conversations um, with a group of people. And so uh, the word that we use a lot are iterations. You will see our competencies and our rubrics go through iterations as we use them and we struggle with them and we have success with them and we learn more. And so this one here actually is a uh, grade banded competency, which is what all of our science ones are at the middle school, is it doesn't matter if you are in um, earth science, life science, or physical science, these competencies can be used um, across all of them. And that's kind of the beauty of the design because initially a lot of people put time into thinking about, well, how does a competency around um, body systems particularly look like? And we had to kind of peel it back and say, let's not get that specific. You know, how can we make this a little bit more broad? What is something that you all do as part of being scientists? Well, we all conduct investigations. And so that was something that as we started to peel that back, um, we determined that we could, we could build a competency around that. So learners will be able to plan and carry out investigations to answer student-driven questions about phenomena. The competency, what's written there, is typically what is needed to be considered competent. So a lot of times you'll see that language replicated in the competent column. Not always exactly word for word, but in many cases you'll see that spirit carried through. On the left side, you'll see the learning criteria. Um, for a particular competency, you might see between three to four, sometimes five learning criteria. It doesn't mean that a student is necessarily going to have to always engage in every single one of these as they go through the learning experiences. But over time, um, a teacher and a student, the learner themselves, should be able to self-reflect and assess where they fall in this particular um, rubric. And so if you look at the learning criteria for designing and conducting investigations, um, a beginning level for a learner would be conducting a scientific investigation and collecting and recording relevant data. As it moves off to the right, you can see that it becomes a little bit more complex in that they are uh, designing and conducting a scientific investigation. Then they design and conduct a repeatable scientific investigation. And then to extending, I can design and conduct a follow-up scientific investigation based on what I learned in a previous investigation. And so the, so the goal isn't necessarily for learners to always have a landing spot over an extending. And in some cases, you'll see learning criteria don't have an extending reference, and that's okay. Um, but we do know that there are learners that will progress through this much more quickly than others. And so we wanted to have an opportunity um, for them to be a part of this. And so science department, uh, Rick was pretty instrumental, was very instrumental, not just pretty. He was very instrumental in that process. Um, and it's kind of, it's fun because they built five competencies. 
And then they quickly said, that's too many. We can't, we can't work with five over the course of a year. And so they had a lot of conversations on kind of just shelving the fifth one and really focusing on, on four of them. And already throughout the course of this year, they are already taking notes and thinking about ways that they can make this more student friendly and how they can rewrite this um, for the next iteration that we would use for next year. So Chris, and, and, can, oh, go ahead, Lisa. I was just gonna say, so I wanna say with rubrics also, there's two priorities and that is the ability to self-reflect throughout the process and then for feedback, teacher feedback, peer feedback, um, even student feedback. So it is very important to include those components and it isn't just a one and done, like this is done at the end of the semester. This is done throughout while that feedback is taking place. So it's very much a living document and they're collecting pieces of evidence. So it might not just be one assignment or one big test, they're collecting evidence throughout the entire semester around these and then showing, yep, I am competent based on these pieces of evidence I selected. And those pieces don't have to be the same for every child. They can be different pieces of evidence that they've collected to show their learning. And so that is a piece where then the, the learner has their own agency over what they're collecting, what they're showing the teacher, and, and how they're defining that for themselves. And Chris, would you say that the, um, uh, along the top, the beginning, approaching, competent, and extending, did those seem to align when you're creating the rubrics with the levels that you talked about? So is the beginning kind of reflective of that recall and reproduction and approaching is getting to the skills and concepts and then competent would be more of that strategic thinking and then that level four around extending, they kind of line up that way? Yeah, and I would say that um, inherent in the beginning part of it, even though it's not necessarily reflected in the verbs, is that level one. That's a lot of the pre-work that goes into, um, I think, having students be ready for uh, a competency-driven experience. And Absolutely. It, and and if I think you th it follows more or less like the support that they need, right? So as they go farther over to the right, they're becoming more and more independent, and then they're even able to apply it independently. And so that's where you see that becoming, you know, the beginning, they just need a lot of support to get there and extending they're just more. And I would say it's students or learners in the competent, they can do that, ex just, sorry, strategic and, and extending. Um, I don't think it's just reserved for the extending yeah. um, right. indicator because um, kids can work at those levels yeah. at the competent. I, I think it's easier if you, th if you look at approaching and competent, a little bit like the one they had before where they had the DOK and they had mm -hmm. one and two and then they had the line three and four. I think it's a little easier to think about it. If you look at beginning and approaching and then you draw a line between approaching and competent, mm -hmm. that that side is more one and two, not always. And this side's a little bit more three and four and it might be a mishmash of it, but that's kind of where the breakdown is. Yeah, yep. thanks. I, I think the other thing too is that, that really needs to be pointed out is, you know, I know that we have a, um, a grading system. It's, everything is built on a ras rationalistic approach. I'm going to put a number on it, right? Mm -hmm. Those numbers that's, are arbitrary, right? We've decided that 90% is this, you know, 80%. That, and, and it's what we've had, right? And there's lots of ways to get to an end product of 70%. But does 70% tell you the same thing about each student, right? Mm -hmm. So you could have a student that goes 70, 70, 70, 70, 70. Yep, you could have a student that starts out really bad and ends with 100%. Their last assessment, they're at 70. And then you can have the backwards. And throughout all of that, there's different bits and pieces they may have, may be missing. But it's not super transparent to everybody. The thing about this that we really like, which goes to Lisa talking about this idea of giving feedback or knowing what I need to do, it's all right there. I mean, it is laid out what the expectation is in terms of what the evidence of learning is. And, that, and, and teachers really support that. And I know that with some of our groups in the high school that have worked on that, you know, it can be really devastating if a student starts out bad. I mean, if I dig a hole and after the first four weeks I'm at 40%, I'm starting to think, how do I get out of this hole? I mean, I, they start, they look at it and, and they give up. And what we've heard from some is, you know, this idea of, oh, that's all I have to do. Because they look from going from beginning to approaching, it doesn't seem as daunting, right? It's a step. That's what I, and then you can help them get from approaching to competent. It is, it, it makes it more transparent and seem more doable mm -hmm. because it's laid out exactly what they need to do. And then they do get some opportunities to choose what those artifacts are gonna be for that.
I'm so, probably going to ask it. Go ahead, Rick. Well, and to that point too, and what's compelling, what makes it really compelling to me is it's just, in, in, in my opinion, it's a, it's a better narrative of the actual learning that's taking place. I'm probably going to ask a question that's on the next couple of slides again, but um, so you asked, you know, you're talking about how students are interacting with the rubric, and I, as a parent, I've come, I, I mostly came into contact with this last year when my kids were home, and and I would remember Joshua was uh, talking about, we're working through a, a language arts assignment, and I was like, he wasn't doing well, all right, <laughs> and and so the question became, are you doing the things? And he said, well, here's the assignment. And that's the first time I'd really ever seen one of those mm -hmm. rubrics, and that may just because it. Uh, the last couple of years forced parents to do a lot of things they weren't accustomed to doing, right? Mm -hmm. for, for, and some of that's great and some of that's been just challenging. Um, so, I mean, how are kids knowing what they need to work on? Is yep. this a conversation that happens at the beginning of the year, the beginning of a quarter? Yep. Uh, or the beginning of an assignment, and this is how this, how, how does that work? Too. Like yep. there's feedback, right? I mean, the teacher should be continuously providing feedback to the, the, to the learners as well as where they're at and what they could be doing or how they can extend themselves and push themselves a little bit further. Mm -hmm. and, and how do those, yes, it, it, it's a continuous conversation. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's trying to figure out how do, how do, what's the best use of teacher student time in a classroom, mm -hmm. right? Yep, we need direct instruction, that's not going away, but how do we build in time to have those conferences and teachers just doing that and we'll be honest one of the most difficult things is that i mean and chris is going to get to a little bit some of the adjustments that we found in infinite campus but learning management systems aren't designed for this so we're trying that's, to use google to support yeah. this which that makes it hard and then the thing that's really difficult we can't find anybody to help us warehouse student contact and student content in a meaningful way. So like a learner profile or portfolio, we've talked to Schoology, we've talked to um, Infinite Campus, we have talked to Apple about there needs to be an intuitive way for kids to grab different artifacts that make that and be able to house it and then maybe keep it because as I get older and I start to think about what are my next stages of my life and am I going to go to a four-year school am I going to go to two-year school am I going to go into the workforce right this idea of portfolio is becoming a much bigger thing than it was ever before I mean when we first started hiring it was GPA let's look at GPAs well now it's like no give me you say you're student-centered give me evidence of that I want to see evidence of that and 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 so to your very point we're trying to figure out ways to not only use our systems to better make that accessible for learners to grab stuff, but for parents, because we know that's frustrating for parents, because it used to be easy, and Chris will talk about this. I look at Infinite Campus, there's this, and now it's like, I'm like, I don't know how to look at this. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I talked to a teacher the other night, and I said, you know, part of my frustration, because I was thinking about this topic, right? Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been really curious about this. Ask Jason, we meet every other yep. week. I'm like, when are we gonna, have, you know, and I know you're, you're meeting with lots of other districts. Yep. And I'm like, well, these are the questions I get from parents every time I'm out of this, and, and I've had them had them too. But uh, I know I started someplace. Now I'm not sure where I was going. But <laughs> Exposure to the rubric for the first time. Yeah, yeah well, but I, 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 the, the challenge has been working within all these systems, and I, I totally get that. Um, I, I uh, um, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll come back to it. But well, and it's Is this shifting, something it, that students it, get like the first day of class, and well, then but it, or, it's beyond that because it, it, it's shifting the model. I mean, it's shifting the whole model of what's the role of the teacher, right? Again, I'll just use me as example. When I taught secondary math, my job was to provide content. That was it. I provided content. If you wanted math content, you either came to my class and listened to me, or you read the book, and nobody was reading the book, right? <laughs> and now. We can get contents lots of different ways. So how do we change those learning experiences so that the teacher can provide context to that and use those different things? And that's thinking about our time differently in classes. It's thinking about how we organize. So yeah, I mean, it's part of all of that. But it's a continual conversation that needs to, to take place in terms of where are you in your learning progression? What do you, you know, what do you think can do that? Or here's some ideas. And how it's, do you do that at scale when you've got, it, in the high school, 150 students it, under or but that's probably not it for yeah. most classes. Well, the, but. the key is you, the teacher's not going to be able to mm -hmm. do that without mm -hmm. the learner really, you know, we use agency, we can use empower, the learner taking control of a lot of that piece right. as well, which they can handle. Now, again, you're talking about another downfall of the system. Mm -hmm. You know, kids come through our system, and they're used to people just giving them information and stuff. We need to, to 
encourage those skills. Yep. And a lot of people argue right. that kids might be too young. Our kindergartners might be too young to be in charge of their own learning, et cetera, so that's the teacher's job. And I'm gonna wholeheartedly disagree with you. We have a team of kindergarten teachers who have taken it upon themselves to have the kindergartners setting their own learning goals. And that's what all of our learners should be doing, is looking at the rubrics, determining where they are right now and where do they wanna go, with the help of the teacher facilitating that. And so we have the, they have their own, because we don't have a very good way to do it, they have their own binders that the kindergartners are keeping track of their own learning goals, and then marking where they're at, and then that's where the teacher is providing the feedback, and then they're looking at where they wanna go. So, so it's I think just the next, I think the next big question is like, how do you bring parents into that process? And maybe that's even making it more complicated, but you know, I'm, there, there's parents in this room, I'm a parent who would love to be more engaged in a, as a, in a partnership with that, like yes. that with my, my so, kids' teachers. But I, I'm gonna you know, dream all, big not, here, and yeah. I'm just gonna tell you, in a perfect world, we don't have report cards that only happen three times a year, <clears> and instead the parents are engaged in that conversation way more frequently, that they're seeing those goals, that the stu the learners are taking it home and showing, hey, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm working on, and this is where I wanna go. And that's really what we want, is that continuous conversation and not just the one-time reporting out to even just our parents as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I know yeah. Chris, we can keep moving. Yeah. I know Chris has, yeah, yeah, yeah. he go wants ahead. to show us some. And I wanna go back to the too. question that you had asked, oh. right? Is, is what does this look like for learners? And I'm gonna give you the example of art. So in art, what oftentimes will happen is they will present the competencies and say this is what it is that we're after over the next 16 weeks because what if we believe that uh, learning is the constant and time is the variable then we're going to really lean into that student agency piece of it and self-reflection is a skill that a lot of our learners currently because of our system are not necessarily very good at right because you'll have our art teachers who will have students self-reflect on the competency and then they will do their own reflection on it and then they come together and then they compare and say, well, why did you feel that you are at this level of, of competency for this particular project? Mm -hmm. And so it's that reflection piece of it that, and modeling what that reflection looks like that helps try to reshape what that, um, that student being at the center looks like. And it's, it's the premise, quite frankly, for you know, student-led conferences at the middle school is trying to turn over who it is that's doing the talking about what the learning looked like. Um, but it definitely is, is really difficult um, when students haven't had a lot of practice. And so we try to build those, those structures in place. You talk about the learner profiles where they can reflect on who they are, what their strengths are, and areas that they want to build upon. You connected a dot for me in my, uh, my seventh grader because he's got reflections for choir, and I never really know what that means. They're just missing all the time. <laughs> And I'm not sure what to... well, I think it's much easier to turn in a worksheet than it is to sit and think and reflect uh -huh. about what I, you know, what did I learn? What was difficult for me? Um, why, do, why did I go through the process I went? That's a little bit more difficult than just doing an ABC yeah. worksheet and then turning it in. Well, I'm so old too. I, I thought of it as a journal entry. Oh, you're just supposed to write about what you did that day. Like, yeah. Well, we, I mean, <laughs> well, to that apparently point, I'm not giving him good advice, right? Yeah, well, so. but we as adults are not great reflectors either. I mean, we really we aren't practiced at it. So, I mean, it's it's a skill that needs to be developed. Right? But how do you get those kids out of their shell to do that? Because, I, I mean, you talk about kindergartners. I would love to just walk into one of the classrooms and just actually see it and hear it myself because I, I'm struggling with that a little bit because you have kids that don't self-reflect or have no clue what that means or, 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 or are very shy and stuff. Mm -hmm. And... To me, those are the kids that get left behind. Those are the the mediocre kids. So how, how do you bring that out in the kids? Well, so I, I can just say that I have a kindergartner who is now a first grader and is also shy. And I was really surprised at his conferences this year to see he had written a one-page reflection on some of the key things that um, that she had she had assessed him on. And then as part of the conference, we talked about these together. So I, I thought that was really neat and I'd never thought of that before, but to your point, like how how are they understanding and reflecting beyond just what I'm doing to, to thinking through about what am I doing well and where can I improve? It was really interesting. Right, but you might be one of those, obviously I know you're one of those parents <laughs> who are highly engaged. I where, mean, a lot of, where a lot of parents, you know, again, it's up to the teacher, I'm gonna drop my kid off and it's up to you to educate. Mm -hmm. And there's still that mentality out there. So how do you not miss those kids mm -hmm that are sitting in the back of the classroom, or even the front of the classroom, and it, it just... It's, it, it actually, this, this actually makes it more difficult to do that. 
Because if you think of a traditional old school classroom where the teacher just sat up in front and lectured. And you mean difficult right? to let those kids slip. You could just, I mean, yeah. kids put their head down and things like this. Now, right, when, they, when, when classrooms are getting into this, there is much more one-on-one -on -one interaction between the teacher and the learner to have conversations around these bits and pieces. It's harder, it is more difficult to just simply hide through those things because you're going to be engaged through that process of feedback one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two. That's a big piece of it. And the system was predicated on the adult determining the one way to demonstrate competency, right? And it's typically aligned with how that um, instructor was successful as a young person. And so when we get out of the way as the adult and we allow multiple opportunities to demonstrate um, different ways of evidence that it might be, and, and I'll go back to college, right? I broke my hand right before finals and I had a sociology exam that actually turned into a verbal conversation. And I couldn't believe it that when I got the report card that I actually had earned the grade that I did because I thought I am in big trouble because I can't do it the way that the instructor, that I thought the instructor would only allow it to be done. And so when we, we allow for these multiple opportunities um, and multiple opportunities to demonstrate over time, is students surprise us in amazing ways of something that we never before would have potentially been open to. And I think too, um, to answer your question, um, a lot of modeling on, for, with the teacher, right? And a lot of practice with the kids, but reflecting can look very different, right? So in kindergarten, maybe they're drawing pictures. Maybe some kids are writing a few words. Um, maybe it's the teacher sitting down and the student just talking to the teacher. So it doesn't always have to be a written kind of reflection. That can look very different depending on what that learner needs and what that learner is more comfortable with in sharing the information that they, they're thinking about. And I want to say that this type of competency-based learning, it's really helpful to like, at least at the high school level, that sort of, it kind of takes the weight off of like getting this good grade, whatever. You can, like for example, this has been implemented in some classes throughout, this, um, the, throughout the school. And you'll have a class where you do some assignments where they don't go into the, the grade book. It's about this competency-based and you're working towards, you work with your teacher and they kind of reflect on, here's how you did on this, now can I improve on this? And it's up to you. The, as the learner to really feel like I'm taking control of my learning. And that's kind of helpful too, because it doesn't make school feel as much of like a nine to five. It's more of like a, this is me putting my foot in the door, going through the door and really putting an effort towards where I want to be. And it seems more accessible. It's not just, oh, how can I make this teacher um, like what I'm producing? It's how can the teacher prove, how can I prove to them that this is what I'm producing and it's my best work? That's a really helpful perspective. Do you find it difficult or do you hear others because there's still a mix of the system? You said some classes are doing this competency based and others are doing reporting. Is there is that challenging for students? You know, some are doing it one way and others aren't, especially if CB approach really works well for them, I guess. I'd say it's quite jarring at first. It's a different way of thinking. It's not just assignment after assignment. Um, like, for example, um, Algebra 2 is a math class offered at the high school required for graduation, so every student takes that one. We do assignments called Depth of Knowledge. Um, I did them last year. And they required students to um, make their own examples of math problems to really see if, if they could produce, write them on their own, then they could probably solve them. <laughs> so that's kind of the thinking. And I'm, when I did that personally, it really helped me um, know what I was doing in math class. But then the next year, it's a little back to more of like the, here's an assignment, I turn it in. So it's not that, it's, it's different, but it's a good different. It kind of changes the way you think as a learner and apply it to many different classes. Think if you're struggling this aspect, maybe you can take what you've learned in a different class and just apply this here. Like, what can I do to really work on this skill? I would also say it's, this particular form of learning is a lot less, I don't want to say not stressful because it's all hard work, but um, like in an, if you're writing an essay for like a language arts class or like I'm in AP language and composition right now and we write a lot of essays. Um, it, it's ev not every single essay isn't like, this is a 50 point thing. I will grade it like the hardest essay you've ever written. It's like, it's more of a, we're gonna write three essays in increasing, excuse me, increasing levels of like difficulty of comprehension and you'll learn along the way and 
as you learn, I'll provide feedback, I'll give you assistance where you need it. And just they'll check in with you along the way until in an ideal world, you're at the end of the lesson, at the end of the trimester, mm -hmm. left with a comprehensive, like you're fully your best work because you've received assistance where you needed it. And they've let you, if you're good at one particular skill, they've really let you explore that skill and let it influence your writing. Wow. Yeah. This type of learning, it really like, when you do something wrong if for the normal assignments, it feels more of like a punishment, like you're getting a point off, it's like, oh darn it. But this type of learning, it's really increasing, like it's allowing us to learn, allowing us to make those mistakes so that in the end we truly feel like we took something away from it and it's not just, here's what we're given and we're punished for not doing it correctly the first time. But that's what school is for, to learn and really process that information. Well, after that, I don't want to go next. Yeah. <laughs> that. that was great. But when we think about um, education, when we think about access to information over the last 40 years, things have changed drastically. I go back to elementary school, and it was the minivan would go off down the road, and I knew the unveiling of what happened or didn't happen was about to go down, right? <laughs> and then over time, what we found is that we shifted everything to an online platform. People created parent accounts. You might remember the big push to get parents to sign up for their family web access, and then how do you do this? And then it was, now it's an app on your phone, right? And I think that it's probably one of the, um, the great tragedies that we've done, because then it's about chasing something. And typically it's chasing points, and it's chasing work. And I don't know if as parents, if you've ever had these like missing assignment notifications set up Never. in campus, where you're getting emails <laughs> and all this type of stuff coming in. It became about the wrong thing. It no longer was really about learning, but it was about going after kind of this game. And so what we know, though, is that there is a need for our parents and guardians and families to have access to information, to be part of that partner in what that learning process looks like. And as Jason said, there is not a product out there that is necessarily designed um, to be as intuitive um, for our learners and for our staff and for our families as we would desire them to be. What we have been doing um, over the last couple of years is really taking a deep dive into campus to figure out what its limitations are and then what are ways that we can maybe rework the use of it to be more competency friendly. So the view that you see here um, would be a learner or parent view signing in to campus from the web is that this was post-mortem data. This was after the end of a term. They would post a grade and you would see a percentage, you would see a letter grade that's associated with it. And in some cases, you might see um, a little comment section that was on there. What I want to do is point out, if you look at the very top for language arts on the far right, you can see that that is a term that was in progress, right? So that was a term that was active and live. A student was in that session. And currently, we always said if a student were to move away today, that's the grade that they would get posted to the new school that they went to. And what we have found, uh, and I'll move ahead here, what we have found is that with the competency um, reporting the way that campus is currently set up was super limiting because it only gave you access to the, comp the level of competency after the term was over. Now again, knowing there's flexibility with going back and demonstrating different layers of competency, you could go back and change that. But for a lot of our parents who were used to real-time instant access, they're like, I can't see a lot of this stuff unless you really did a lot of clicking to yeah. kind of get in. And so what we've been spending time, and you'll see this, how the color changes from orange to green as campus gives us the ability to play in the sandbox. And so for the better part of a year, as we've been taking a look at how can we change what campus does to be more friendly for the learner and for families at home. And so here's an example of um, a, real a real time, what they call a estimate of proficiency or proficiency estimate. Um, it does some things that I think philosophically we don't necessarily agree with, is that it takes multiple pieces of evidence and it tries to do some sort of calculation to say, we think that the learner is approximately at a level of competent for this particular competency. Um, but it's something that we feel like has been a barrier for a lot of our families to say, I can't see a lot of this stuff until later on. And so we feel like that this is a potential move to give them access to information that is a little bit more real time. I think I understand the challenge, but that is, that's, you know, like I said, as a parent, I as a parent want to be helping out, uh, cajoling, cat hurting cats, whatever, uh, providing guidance to my kid as needed throughout the process too. And I think that's where a lot of parents are 
Um, and, and, and so you're right, that, that not, that flying blind until the end of the quarter was, has been frustrating. And I think that's where I get a lot of questions, um, not just from my own, but from others as well. So yeah. this is, this, this sounds promising, uh, you know, yep. I know you're having a hard time with it, but it also sounds good. <laughs> it, it's a, you're balancing stakeholder needs here, right? Yep. And that's, a, that's an important well, one. Well, and I think to your point too, right? I mean, when you asked again, you know, back, you know, how do kids know where they are? I mean, they're used to seeing the, oh, I'm at 60% in progress. I mean, I got to get going sort of a thing. And, and being able to, you know, even though we're not happy with some of the things in the background, we can hide that. But even being able to say, okay, on this competency right now today, I'm in progress, but I'm competent. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good there. I need to maybe now go work on this other one because, you know, I'm approaching. But sure. it, it helps kind of frame out where am I in right now? not only for parents who want to know that, but also for the learner as well. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a teacher who uses a competency-based approach, you this is this is populated then in in infinite campus as mm -hmm. at the beginning of your course or your year or your term and then i'm a parent of a student i can go in and see those competencies from the from the start too and what they're working towards mm -hmm. in the student same thing too. for me when i pop open the app right i'm guilty of this i take a look at where should i focus my time and conversation mm -hmm. And then you would be able to dig in a little bit deeper to see what are those pieces of evidence that's leading to maybe a, a real-time estimate of beginning, right? Maybe there are some things that haven't been submitted. Maybe there are a number of things that are showing that they're having a difficult time moving over to something that's a little bit more complex. And, and to us, that's the real value of, of really thinking about learning as opposed to, you know, the system tells me I have an 87.92% which this piece of paper tells me that's almost a B plus, but not quite. Well, what does a B plus mean anyway? You know, when we think about that, maybe they're having a difficult time um, doing a repeatable investigation. That's the value in how you help them over that hurdle. So not to throw a, a wrench into it, but since I have elementary school kiddo, I don't use anything but Seesaw right now as mm -hmm. a parent. And so how does this look different for our parents and our teachers who are using that platform? So we have not found a good way to put the rubrics out there for Seesaw um, because we use Schoology as the district format. So that would be up to the school to kind of determine how to best provide that in the Seesaw format. And also, um, our elementary, we are in a time of transition, right? So even our school board um, student members here said it, not every teacher is doing this right now. And that's where I think we're having some confusion with our parents out in the community too, because right. it's not top down. We're not mm -hmm. forcing this on anyone. People are seeing the value of it and then they're jumping on board. And once the teachers see that value and they start using it and they start seeing what it, the opportunities it provides for all the students, they become very passionate about it. and it, isn't something we're telling them to do. So um, so when they're working with the rubrics, it's a lot of sending things home with the parent, or sending things home with the learners, talking to the parents, using it at conferences, to kind of show them where they're at on that. Um, we do have a few teachers who are in the upper elementaries that use more Schoology, and then they're populated okay. in the infinite campus. Yeah. yeah, so the reality is is that um, Seesaw is not a student management system. It, it was never designed. I mean, it's designed to share and things like that. So as we continue to transform, you know, and make it easier for these things, we will probably see an increase in, you know, the reporting going out in infinite campus and elementary schools. And if you're a parent then of an elementary school kiddo and you're wondering how does the teacher approach it, you could ask, do you to help me understand as my kiddo's getting started this year, do you use a competency-based approach with a rubric or do you use um, you know, a different or more traditional? And yep, absolutely. Should be able to and we even have that. teachers who are tiptoeing into it in different subjects, right? Mm -hmm. So they might be doing more competencies in our science and language arts and uh, social studies math. Don't We don't have the rubrics built yet. So they aren't quite there yet in that process. So yeah, definitely talk to the teacher and they'll be able to talk, uh, explain it. Yep. How does this map to, and I'm sorry, I was gonna, I'm peppering with questions that kind of throughout, but how does this map then to um, 
I don't know about ACT or SATs, but certainly college entrance or other future education. Like how do, I don't see A, Bs and Cs. How does this map to a grade point average? You so, brought up car so, insurance. So the currently, discount. so, but again, right, we live in multiple systems and we still understand at the high school yeah. that a transcript is important. So the classes that um, are reporting out in competencies will translate that into a grade at the end of the, of the, of the trimester okay. and stuff. So in a perfect world, right? I mean, when you when this becomes a system wide approach, there is a couple of different like mastery transcript is one where they do some pieces. But again, that's really about how do you build that portfolio, right? So that when I go, because I mean, there's the college entrance is in flux, right? We see some schools that have backed off now needing an ACT scores. Others said you do, but. Obviously, having the ability to have artifacts is an important piece, and that'll be an essential part, but we still have. At the high school, there's still a transcript. Okay. How do we get consistent, though? I mean, that, that's got to... Uh, are we so, ever so, going to get there? Yep. So, the, so there's a couple things now. We have to remember, right, that um, the idea is, and, and, and different learning experiences, in our mind, isn't necessarily a bad thing, because it gives learners an opportunity to figure out how do I learn best right and also to what you know both of our students talked about is if I'm in a situation or a class that I don't necessarily learn best in I do have skills to be able to navigate that and do those different things and so there is some good parts to being able and do different things the thing we know in education is this if we want to ever kill anything we come in with an initiative because if people aren't ready to do the things that they've talked about, you know, in terms of relooking at how my classroom looks and how those different things and how I'm going to use my time and go through this, it, it's not going to produce the results that we want to see or the impact that we have. So we move in the direction. So what have we done? We've taken opportunities at the bigger level. So we have our competency built K through 12 in English language arts competencies built in science, science working on social studies right now, then math will be the big one. So we work, we, we create those bigger ones because we have a small district and learning and team. And then at the same time, as teachers and groups look at these things differently, we support them and build that through there. But when I'm looking, I, I'll pick on you two for a minute. The, you guys are high performers. I mean, as students. No, I, and I commend you for that. So. I'm more concerned too, we're gonna to have those other kids that aren't high performers, and we're gonna be switching with two different ways of teaching, kind of. But that's happened all the time. I mean, I might go to, you know, prior to this, I might go to a class that's all lecture, 100% lecture, and I might go to another class where it's all project-based. That, that's happened in education all the time. I don't, that's not something new. But wouldn't we strive to be more consistent so we, we yep. and don't have that? And we're working. That's, I mean, that is one of the things that we are working on to become more system-wide with that. Okay. Yes. Can I, can I say something, too? So one of the things that, like, we, the, the preparation for this has been understanding uh, Webb's depth of knowledge and the design of learning experiences. And so that is consistent K-12. And so even if... A teacher is not ready yet, or a grade level isn't ready yet to address it in terms of competency. The design of learning mm -hmm. is growing in its consistency, and that's what's actually happening. That's that's that affects the actual uh, classroom dynamics and the pedagogy used to create those learning experiences. And so that that's there's a real consistency there because that's the training and coaching that we've done. Mm -hmm. in all buildings across grade levels. Yeah, the foundational piece is the, the, the pieces that go into the design of learning, yeah. and then the piece that we're transitioning to is how do you report that learning out? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, yeah. mm -hmm. my question kind of is piggybacking what Steve was saying is like we've had, we've kind of had this diversity of classes for a while because when we started with the hybrid model and the flip classroom model, even before we were doing stay at, the stay at home kind of learning, there were some classes that were flip and there were some classes that were not. And correct me if I'm wrong, but at some points at the high school, students were able to choose which type of class they had, whether it was a hybrid or whether it was more of a standards or there, there were some choices in, with what in courses In some of were. the classes, some that courses. was true. Yep. So my question is going into these classes based on that historical context, do students know when they walk in the door, when they're registering the class, 
what the grading competencies are going to be like, whether it's going to be more of the standard or is it going to be more of this competency based piece or a hybrid of it or do they have any idea? So as you're saying, like as they learn what works for them, I remember going to class in college with the teacher the first day said, this is how I teach. If you don't like it, you're paying for it, go to a different style, and which was great because I fit well with the style and I loved it. But in terms of like, so our learners can be in the driver's seat to be in the, mm -hmm. what works for them. And granted, you don't always have that choice and sometimes it's good to be exposed to other pieces as well. Typically, typically when, when te it's, it's by teams. Okay. and stuff and so if I have a ninth grade English experience that experience is going to be similar for all ninth graders if I have an algebra 2 experience that's going to be similar now the algebra 2 experience might not be the same as the geometry experience if that makes sense but that's designed by team and stuff so that's not a great answer to the question it's kind I, of no, yes and kind saying, of no though. yeah I, I think um, I'm sure by word of mouth um, kids <laughs> know that when I take chemistry in the chemistry is organized this way, so I'm, I know how that is going to be organized. If I take this, probably as ninth graders, they don't know as much of that. Well, and that's helpful too, because I think another question that I could hear kind of from the board members is kind of having that consistency where we'd like to have some consistency across the district. If you're a ninth grader, you have a similar mm -hmm. course load. If you're a fifth grader, no matter what school you're at, that it's similar, even though there are nuances in the different buildings in terms of knowing that yep. the teams have similarities that they are experiencing. And again, right, so the, but we go back to the original design of learning, right, is around the depth of knowledge and getting yep. those pieces in around the standards and built that way. So those are the foundational yeah. pieces. So I'm just gonna, like, so here's an example too. So, I mean, the student board members, thank you for your examples too, but like, this is a very common project that you would find in a classroom, right? That mm -hmm. you gotta create this poster about a famous person, have five pieces of evidence, five facts, um, maybe include a picture, et cetera. It's all a list of skills that they need to do. It's a checklist, right? There's no real depth or rigor, but yet the teachers are like, but I'm providing choice. They can write a paragraph, do this, et cetera. And so it's minor tweaks to those learning experiences that really, oops, I went the wrong way, that get to the depth. So I'm going to tell you, I was one of those A students and I loved that assignment before because I knew exactly what I needed to do and how to do it. Then you put a project like this in front of students and they go, well, what, what do you really want? How many pages do you need? How many paragraphs? How long do you need to have it? But it's not about that. It turns to the learning. And this can happen in any classroom, regardless of it competency-based or not. It's still hitting our standards. It's still hitting the competencies. And the competencies are just a way to report out on that learning so that we're really targeting that learning when we're reporting. And so it's minor tweaks that we're helping our um, teachers do within their own learning experiences. One, this is an odd question probably to ask. So if I'm going to school to be a teacher, am I gonna learn this process so when I come out my first year, in education? No. <laughs> so, okay. So, so, How do so, you bring so, teachers so, along? so, right. So, so our yeah, is, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. So, okay. here's what we, we, this has fundamentally changed uh, how we hire as well, right? So, we do yeah. two things mm -hmm. we take as many student teachers as we can get. Okay. So, if, if somebody wants to be a student teacher, we work as hard as we can to place them in our district because that does two things for us it gets them into our culture and understand kind of the basics of this so they know what they're getting into and we get to help you know train them through this process and that even goes to the you know the original placements a lot of times they do a 25 hour placement so we have a kind of a partnership with Hamlin so we get them that way and then also we get a free kind of you know six months to see is this person worth keeping outside of that uh, we do a lot of um, our interviewing is a lot of mindset because this is is fundamentally changing how you think about learning design and my role as an educator right and if people have the right mindset we can get them up to speed you know we have different workshops that we do we have different things during the summer we can get them up to speed on the basics of the learning design around web's depth of knowledge and those other pieces so they can get those fundamental things and then transition to the reporting out that's much sooner but that's it goes back to the original thing that lisa had up there you know it we 
we have, I'll be honest with you, our, our team has been the support for the state of Minnesota. So if, if schools want to dive into this, when the new science standards came out, you know, Rick was supporting districts within slingshot of here because people looked at those, these aren't, these aren't look like the regular standards. They're not the same thing because they, they are written significantly differently because it's not, the content is the vehicle to these other things instead of the content being the end point. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So um, so we were super excited when we saw in the governor's supplement of the bed that they're they're going to fund professional development around this and do those things because there there isn't a lot of that. It's it's very traditional sort of things. And we've seen that, you know, through the past two years, the more people have leaned on that compliance based educational model, the harder it's been been for them and stuff. So it's it, it's made us think differently. And I know you've asked about our low level learners and even our high level learners, they need to be involved in these activities all day, every day. And they have personal experience where these two are out in the classroom supporting teachers, helping guide them through this. They've been there when a teacher comes to pull out for services and the students don't wanna go because the learning is so important that's happening in that classroom and they've had to work with that teacher to say, this isn't the right time to pull those students out because this is the type of learning that they really need. And so we're just trying to work with balancing all that and provide these sorts of activities, even um, combining um, cross content areas, mm -hmm. cross content structure, et cetera. And how do we provide that for our learners Absolutely. all day? Every day. And I would just say being in some of these classrooms where the teachers are providing these type of learning experiences, I call it kind of the three E's, the excitement, engagement, and um, uh, what was the third one? Ah! <laughs> excitement, engagement, and energy that the students are showing while they're creating these. It's fantastic. Um, I, I hope that you get to experience coming in a classroom and watching these kids and the creative juices that are flowing and the things that they're coming up with and the terminology that they're using for their grade level is just, it's its fantastic. So contact either one of these, yeah. they will yeah. set you up in a classroom K through 12 to experience it for sure. I think the challenging part is getting that kiddo started and once they get started, I, I, I see the huge benefit of that. It's that thought process. I'm just struggling with getting that kindergartner or whomever started. Well, actually, actually the, the younger kids are, are better Way to get better. this started because we haven't driven yeah. out this idea of exploration, making mistakes and things like that. They're, they're excited, they're, they're ready to learn. It's harder with the older kids because they've kind of become accustomed to this, this system of how things go and you know, the, a traditional system, the students actually don't carry a very high cognitive load. The teacher carries the very high cognitive load because they're the ones doing a lot of the work, the providing stuff, and, and kids are kind of used to sitting there. If I sit here long enough, somebody will tell me, right. you know, I'll do the thing. So I, we've actually seen it with the older kids. It's harder yeah. than the younger kids. Sure. They're all for it. I would say, too, Rick and I were in a kindergarten classroom. Was that right before COVID? Mm -hmm. Right before COVID, and I know some of the kindergarten teachers were a little like hesitant. They were like, oh, I don't know if the kids are going to be. Um, the kindergartners were engaged for over an hour, mm -hmm. and the teachers were just, they could not believe it. I mean, these kids were going, and we, they were thinking maybe 15 minutes, because you know with little ones, their <laughs> attention span is not as much. Um, over an hour, those kids spent creating and designing, and it, I don't know. It, yeah, it was. It was. So and it, building, it is happening. And building on that, Carrie and Rick um, and Lisa too. I wonder if you can expand on um, on particularly the support available to both parents of kids in elementary as well as teachers, because in our last few meetings we have talked about how the gifted and enhanced learning program is going to be impacted moving into next year, and um, and we've heard as a board from a number of parents who have spoken to their kiddos' teacher who said, I really don't know what more to do with them or or how how to support them. So can you just help our um, our community and um, anyone who's following this understand 
what um, what the plan is for providing um, you know personalized support for students um, as this program is sunsetted next going into next year and and then teachers too would they contact their building principal um, and then they meet with you just help help us understand what that might look yeah. like um, so actually these are the types of experiences when I actually brought up before that the students were being pulled for services that was specifically gel. Yeah, they did not want to be pulled from that because what they were doing in the classroom was so much more engaging and what they really needed and lasted throughout the whole day. Huh. And that's what we need to be doing is providing those services all day for those students, not just 20 minutes twice a week. So how can we do this? We need to rethink that, reevaluate yeah. that. And so if parents have questions, they should definitely contact the principal within their building um, because the principals are approaching it similarly but yet uniquely to each building based on the needs and so um, it's about providing that staff development to teachers making sure that they're working within that that's why we have coaches to help um, support those teachers too who want to see it more in action they've been in most classrooms across the district already and so it's just about making sure that they're applying it to all their content as well and, and most of those services were provided the last couple of years in a push-in model anyways and not a pull-out model. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that had been done similar to what Rick and Carrie have, have done with other classes to go in, model those experiences and support those experiences, and that they'll continue to be able to do that. They'll be a big piece of that. And teachers know how to access that support too if they're concerned about how does oh, yeah. this impact yeah. me next year and how do I do this for, yeah. for all of my children. Yep. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. I just want to say thank you. It's nice. I get tired of PowerPoints and you can't get the heart of what we're trying to understand here, especially this topic. So I commend you guys for coming in and, and well, I'm still thinking about this thing. Yeah. Um, I know. And normally our presentation has more hands on experience, but then it takes longer. Yeah. And we already had our great time. information though. So yeah. that's yeah. And I'll go ahead. Sorry, and I had one other question, which was around some of the teachers who may have expressed concerns around this approach. Do you, um, I guess, how do you approach that strategically with identifying the concerns for those teachers who, who um, aren't using this, who are wondering more about it, and, and then is it, does it look like bringing champions or peers together? Can you just talk more about how that's being shared? while recognizing that's not a top-down do this, but. Yeah, usually their colleagues are the best voice for mm -hmm. it, right? So if we can connect them with people across the district who are doing it, mm -hmm. that is the biggest voice. So I'm gonna say, so kindergarten teachers, you know, they think, oh, they can't do that. But then once we're like, oh, come visit this team over at this building, yeah. we'll provide release time, we'll get you, you know, our coach to sub for you, or we'll have a coach come in. Absolutely, then they suddenly go, whoa, I didn't know this was possible. This is super exciting. And then talking to a peer who's actually doing it is the most powerful thing. Okay. And so that's where we want to go as much as possible is getting those teachers to talk about what they're doing and who's using it already. Okay. And I think some of it's confronting fear, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. we, Change I don't know that we, yeah. we could have seen a system where um, college entrance was not heavily relied on with ACT scores, right? And we're moving in the direction that that is the case. Um, what we found at the secondary level is that our system created a lot of fear, that we created a lot of assignments that had a lot of points that justified whatever it was the computer spit out, mm -hmm. right? Because then we could go back and say, well, it's because of this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. And so we've been in a position where we've got a lot of freedom and flexibility um, to, I think, have those fears become unfounded, where it isn't so much about that it's, it's about this letter grade versus this competency and that when you turn it over, when you turn the agency over to the learner and the learner can speak to this stuff, these are all those skills and dispositions that Jason talked about that we're looking for with people. I'm not looking at transcripts, GPAs, I'm not looking at colleges. What I'm looking at is how do they write? How do they communicate mm -hmm. to me? How do they grab my attention? What experiences have they put themselves through that says they can help propel our system to where it needs to go? Of course, I have something to say. <laughs> Make sure. No, what I think what's interesting is one, I love the enthusiasm. I love you sharing this. I love the opportunity that the community will have to hear this because a lot of things are misinterpreted from competence, I can't say it, based learning, um, especially because they feel there is the conception that um, you take away the grade, that it takes away the effort. And our student school members, board members spoke highly to how that worked and understand that. I think that was great. I also look back at my education career and remember, I don't remember 
getting, you know, the good, I don't remember like just those one and two parts. I remember the three and four. I remember the experiences where I dug in and was able to have an experience and really understand the content that I was learning. I don't remember just doing the rote facts and I can't even tell you the rote facts that I was supposed to learn, but I remember those experiences we've had and that's something where you, I'll never forget those. And I think our students will be the same way. And if every part of their education is like that, what an incredible experience and journey they'll have forward within their career. So I just love your enthusiasm. It's funny, Steve was like, I didn't even notice the time. Once again, just like with yeah. our students, we've <laughs> talked about this for a long time. And and it's I think it's very important and it matters. And I'm excited to see where it goes. You know, one suggestion I would have, I'm going to go back to you two down here, is you hear it from the student, boy, you get a whole different mm -hmm. education, especially sitting on this side of it, is bringing those individuals out to the buildings to speak with the educators or teachers on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the passion, you guys, just listening to you, just the excitement, I, I mean. How much did they pay you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and we have to, the other part to that too, right? And this is something that we've been out of practice with our board and our board meetings the last couple of years is bringing in mm -hmm. right. our educators and our learners to share what these different experiences look like. Just because it's, I mean, it, it's been upside down. We really haven't wanted to ask teachers because they're just frazzled with this year and things like that. But that'll be yes to that and the other pieces. And we'll have those showcase days and things like that again where we can bring in the elementary, middle school, and high school kids to share what those different learning experiences look like. And, and from, to your point, from what they, you know, their mouths. For parents that are in doubt or have questions, though, I mean, just listen to you two, uh, you would change your mind instantly. Because I think sometimes people think that, we're here to dictate, you know, what we say right. is what we do, but it, that's not the case. And it's from information that you guys provide, so. And I think there's a connection here too, that um, a larger piece are, that's tied to some of the challenges we're facing from um, declining enrollment and misunderstandings in our community around what drives, what makes a good education. If you're a, a, a person looking to buy a home in Farmington, I see in, on social media, right, they're pulling things from like the, the great education that's pulling one very tiny small portion and they don't understand the approach and the way um, that our education system here is really leading the way and doing something unique. And I think if more um, more parents and more community members understood that and could help tell that story and advocate for that, I imagine a lot of people, even in surrounding communities, would be very interested in, in having their children participate in, in that type of learning environment as opposed to the more traditional ones. Yeah, I know this would be an important conversation. I'm really glad we got to, got to get to it. I know that um, other districts are coming and talk to you, to you and, and trying to learn from the experience here. Um, I think that's an excellent point, Hannah. I, that's, the, that's the thing. Um, it's not necessarily the old system that generated fear. It's change always drives fear until the only way to move, make people move from one, one system to the next is to show them that the next is a better system, right? Mm -hmm. Then they will come with it. That's, that's what you're seeing with your teachers, right? Yeah. And, and so the challenge I think I put forth for us all right now is as we're moving to another system, or as we've, you've identified a system that is better for this district, we need to really uh, over-communicate and do a, uh, uh, really emphasize and put a lot of energy behind that communication and that engagement, um, not just with the teachers, but with the parents. And I, you know, I, I'm not naive enough to think that, well, well, we've talked about it for an hour and a half or, uh, at the school board meeting, so we've done our job. Um, some people will tune into this, some people won't. Some people that are in the audience will share what they learned here today. Um, but I, and, but our, our communications methods are so limited. We don't have great news, you know, lots of great newspapers that cover just the Farmington school yeah. area. But and we've how done, do we do that open house yeah. thing. And we've do done we the family engagements. And, and again, you know, pre-pandemic and, sure. you know, in one of our, mil and we have to get, most certainly have to get back to those things. Be and, and the hard part with a lot of this stuff, you know, I, I can think back when Melissa talked about, you know, flip classrooms mm -hmm. and things like that was the principal at the time. And we did stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people didn't care until they cared. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then unfortunately, the right. best conversations you have are those one on one conversations. Right. But, you know, you'd like to do some things beforehand. And, um, you know, I, and, and we'll admit we're, we're not near we're not perfect at this. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we are we we are trying to transition to something that we think is fundamentally better in terms of equipping our learners for the future than what the previous system was. And that, that's messy. And, I, and 
you know, Kyle or somebody said brought up a good point, right? You know, I think one big thing that, that everybody is struggling in education right now is we don't have a defined purpose. I think we I think we have a general idea of what we believe the purpose is, but I think that's where it's hard of, of, of people trying to define. I think early on it was really easy. We're going to get you ready to go work in a factory or you're going to be a manager. And then it was we're sending everybody to college. Well, that's, we don't need that stuff anymore. What do we need? And so that that makes it difficult, too. So. Yeah, well, I, I think the work is great. I'm again, thank you for coming to talk to us about it. Thank you for this very interactive conversation. Um, really so I'm looking forward it. to seeing where it goes and how we can continue, like I said, to, to bring the community along with it. Yeah, All right, thanks. well, that was, that was the shorter of the two presentations tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, earlier this spring, we um, started the discussions about providing an full online learning program or even a hybrid what that could possibly look like in our school system K through 12. And so the elementary, we sent a survey out, um, the survey window was back in February, and trying to determine what the interest would be for a full online learning, because at that point, we weren't sure um, where to necessarily go with a hybrid model, and it became confusing. So we just decided to go with who would be interested with a full online learning. Um, and we had uh, 22 to 23 families with learners in grades through five that, uh, Oh no, and our target, excuse me, our target audiences, I apologize, um, were to target those students that are currently going to be in K through five next school year. So um, we sent it out to all of the parents who have incoming kindergartners and then the current first or fourth graders. And then we also sent it to homeschool students. And so when we send this out, we want parents not to just think about online or what that could mean, but to th really think about does their learner or does their child actually match with an online learning program? So we ask parents to kind of self-reflect about their child and determine would they be able to do these different attributes and um, answer honestly yes or no. And then they usually did tell us, yep, they can do these things or no, maybe not these things. And that's all good information for us to use and helping to determine if it would be a good program for those students. Um, and so we, we classified it as full on-time learning, but then with possible in-person activities at, at various times. So we only had 37 that actually expressed interest in K through five. And I broke it down in grade levels because really if we're looking at doing a program, if we don't have enough learners in one grade level, then we could look at maybe doing a multi-age grade level. And when you look at that, um, very low in K1, so probably not a possibility to do on learning, two, three, also, 13 students to one staff member, a very low uh, ratio there. Um, so then we came to four, five, and looking at that, there were 19 students that expressed interest. So now I wanted to go the next level deeper. And what I did is I took those names, I went to um, the school buildings, kind of looked at the names and kind of said, what do you think? Based on the way the parents answered, what do you think? Do you have any hesitations? And of those 19, there'd probably be some reservations on a few of those students. So it wouldn't be a full class of 19 where an online program would probably be the best fit for mm -hmm. that child. So, um, so we're just looking at very low respond, responding answers to that online program. Then uh, similarly created a, a survey for students that would be in grade six through 12 for next year, um, same survey window. Uh, we also targeted our homeschool families and then those that we could strategically identify that left for an online experience. And so we kind of poured through all that data. Um, and this survey was constructed a little bit differently, but it was focused on a lot of the same learner attributes. And I was really interested in taking a look at, yes, those that were interested in a full-time online experience, but then are there those that are looking for a partial blend of, of both approaches? Um, and so what we what we asked them for, you know, did you want the full time online, a blend of both, or are you unsure? And in February, right, we still had a lot of uncertainty as to how this pandemic was unfolding and whether or not it was wrapping up and it had an end. And that still, I think, is a big contributor to people's minds. Was interested in finding out what type of experience might they want, um, particularly if it was just a part time. W were they looking for some sort of elective experience that would be online, or did they want to have a blend of both? And so you can see that for the middle level, 
Um, these are both uh, middle school populations combined, is that we only had two um, families that were interested in a full-time online learning experience. Um, a little bit more that was interested in some sort of blend. Um, and what you'll see coming up is that it was really all over the board as to what their particular interest was. It might be a math class, it might be, um, FIAD might be an online class. And then at the high school, not a significant number that wanted a full-time online um, experience by grade level. We do have more flexibility, I think, at that high school level to do some multi-grade um, experiences, but we still needed to have some numbers and capacity that we felt um, good about. And to Lisa's comment also is our principals took a look at the data on who the families were and if there were certain supports that they needed or certain tendencies that they exhibited out of our previous bouts of hybrid learning or full um, at home. And uh, what you'll see next is um, we really struggled in the fact that it, there was no real easy way to identify where we could put, I think, time and resources. Um, we felt like core, trying to build something around a core experience, we just did not have a sizable number. And you can see in red, in talking to Dan Pickens, principal at the high school, is because our elective classes do have a little more flexibility with kind of multi-age approaches to it, is that there could be the potential um, to create a couple of sections that are more of a, an online experience. And so that's where we've been focusing um, some of our more recent time and energy is that uh, we're not necessarily looking at, we, we are not gonna be looking at organizing to provide a full online experience because we don't believe that we have the interest. Um, and, and I think to Kyle's point that he made maybe a board meeting or two ago, is that a lot of times when you create something new is you have a heavy upfront investment that you know is there and that you hope that over time you build capacity where it becomes a revenue generator. And what we see is that when you go from, I think online providers probably in the upper teens to now approaching close to 100, is there becomes a supply and demand issue. Um, and so that's something that we wanna be really mindful about is um, there are things that we believe that we are really good at organizing too. And we believe that this is something that we could, um, but we question whether or not we really have the capacity um, to build this in a short amount of time. And so um, for the elementary and middle schools, as we mentioned, is that we're gonna really just kind of pause any organizing to it and maybe planning isn't the best word, but organizing to that for next year. It's still something that we're gonna engage in conversations with our staff about for, for future opportunities. And then at the high school is we are taking a look to see do we have instances where we could reorganize the staffing that we have to potentially provide a couple of sections? And the complexity of that, right, when you get into the, the unique conversations with families is where it starts, I don't wanna say breaks apart, but it gets so individualized is that there are families who are like, well, I really want um, a fifth period class to be, and no TC, but a fifth period class to be online because it provides flexibility for my learner in this way. They might travel over to Chaska for a gymnastic experience on an everyday basis. Uh, but it's something that we're taking a look at. It's still our intent, because um, we're almost done with getting full authorization from MDE. It's still our intent to uh, complete that process so that we do have the authority to do that. And then depending on how things look into the future is we could potentially organize to that. So Mr. happy Sheriff, to take questions. I think you're kind of going to that point, but like if you have, if people are more looking for an elective, I feel like it'd be very difficult to find something that would be suitable for the, the, the small number you have there. And then the other question was, if you were to pick an elective or two that would fit the base that's, that's interested in an elective, would it be in additional to their school day? I mean, how would that work for like the staff in terms of the time and the mm -hmm. workload? Well, in that it is April, late April, and we're pretty deep into the staffing process and scheduling process. Um, we feel like it would potentially be hard to try to reorganize given the budget approaches that we've taken. Um, but it could be something where if we have some departments that have some flexibility with time, meaning that we might have uh, part-time folks that have some flexibility in what their schedule looks like and we could, and there's of interest and it makes a lot of sense to organize into an online piece is that that could be something that we do. We do think that for next year, 
is that we would be able to go into the registration process with pre-identified communication to say that these are courses that likely would be offered in both an in-person and an online approach. And do you have an interest in one or the other? Because then we can really target through that piece of it students that say, yeah, I really have an affinity to take, I'll just say ah, ceramics isn't a good one, but uh, painting, watercolors um, in an online fashion. Because that is something that lends itself, I think, potentially better than some others. So, because it kind of makes so, me think of like a zero hour class, like what you could well, throw in, but it wouldn't be at zero hour. But you know, it, it would be part of the teacher's normal day. It wouldn't okay. be an add on. So okay. they, that's kind of what I was wondering where yeah, it would fit. And, and yeah, there's lots of different things. I mean, you might have an in person component part of it because you want some check ins and things mm -hmm. like that, and that could take lots of different times. Mm -hmm. And I think. The, it, Part of the thing that Chris touched on, but didn't, and, you know, you'd have to go in and look at the registration of these kiddos, and and maybe you are lucky that he used ceramics, and you know, online online ceramics isn't isn't a great example, but you know, it, it would have to be something where they all have, you know, that same elective and stuff. So the chances are pretty slim that it's going to work this year. Now again, right, this is all, we're waiting to see what comes from, you know, the state, right? And, and we've talked about if we have additional money that we can invest, this might be an area where we want to invest. So um, if MDE allows us to do this, do we have a certain time frame to implement this? Nope. Okay. So actually the good news is, is by mm -hmm. becoming an, an online learning provider, it actually gives us flexibility throughout our entire system. Mm -hmm. okay. So even if we don't have an online program this year, it allows us flexibility that we wouldn't have had before. And after all the work they put in to get this thing through, we're gonna see it to the end, whether we do it this year or not, because it was yeah. Why very- Why wouldn't you, right? Yeah, no, it seemed like a good thing to, to yeah. continue to explore. I appreciate the research you put into it. Uh, my biggest concern, honestly, was just any distraction it was on existing resources, which were already stretched very thin. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know, any other comments? Mike, Michael, Kennedy, anything? All right, thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I get a motion to approve acceptance of reports and communications? I'll make a motion to approve, accept, uh, acknowledge receipt of reports and communications. Second. Forward by Simmons, or <laughs> motion by Simmons, second by Carrero. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, our next item is uh, administrative action. We have approval of the 2021 and 2022 budget amendment that we reviewed at the working session two weeks ago. Chair Christensen, board members, Superintendent Berg, members of the community, I am here tonight to finalize uh, our budget amendment for the 21-22 school year. It will be coming up momentarily uh, but basically what it is, is it's an increase in revenue and expenditures of roughly 982000 each, which provides a balanced budget still for the 21-22 school year. So at this time, I'll take any questions that anyone might have. Are there any questions? I think we discussed it in pretty good detail at the working session. So um, seeing no other questions, can I get a motion to pass this budget amendment? So moved. Second. Motion by Carrero, second by Simmons. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Our next item is approval of temporary construction easement for the Whispering Fields development. Dan? Uh, good evening, Chair Christensen, member of the board, uh, Superintendent Berg, and members of the community. Um, I don't even have a presentation. So um, just a quick <laughs> piece, um, as you are w uh, hopefully well aware, um, the Whispering Fields uh, development by DR Horton, which is immediately to the south of the Farmington High School campus. Uh, we worked with both the city of Farmington as well as the developer last year when they started the development um, as part of some of the plat work uh, that had to be done. Uh, because of you know, weather, um, supply chain issues, so on and so forth. Uh, they were not able to complete a pedestrian path um, that is uh, to extend out of the development um, and then onto the school district property that was part of our arrangement with the developer. Uh, we believe that that's a significant advantage, uh, benefit to uh, obviously the development and then us as a school district. 
um, to provide that uh, continuous paved pathway from those developments onto our high school campus. Um, the, we had approved a uh, similar uh, easement um, last year, uh, but it expired uh, at, at the end of the calendar year. And since we weren't able to finish it up, um, we're asking for another construction easement um, to uh, do the work uh, to complete that path here, um, this, hopefully this, uh, this summer. Um, so that it's a little bit hard to uh, delineate exactly where this is, but basically uh, it's on the south side of the high school campus. There are a couple of retaining ponds in there. It basically comes right through um, between those two retaining ponds from, uh, from the south and will connect up to a paved um, walking path at the high school. So um, basically what, we're, what I'm asking for is uh, basically an extension, but uh, a new um, uh, permission basically for this construction easement so that DR Horton can uh, proceed with that pathway. I don't know if there's any questions regarding that. Will that be done this year? Yeah, th right. their, their intent, uh, we had a construction meeting actually, I think it was last week with both uh, the uh, DR Horton as well as the city of Farmington planners. Um, they are looking, well, if you've driven by there, you can see that they are uh, continuing to move dirt and put up houses. Um, and actually moving forward with the second phase of that development. Um, and so they intend to structure the, uh, the path build with work that's going on in the development, specifically as it pertains to curb and gutter and asphalt. Okay. Any other questions? Nope. Can I get a motion to uh, approve the temporary construction easement for West Spring Fields? So moved. Second. Motion by Simmons, second by Carrero. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion is approved. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, last item under administrative actions is approval of non-renewal uh, termination of probationary teachers. Bob Arian. Thank, Thank you. you. Chair Christensen, members of the board, Superintendent Berg, and members of the community. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, we are about 95% uh, through our staffing process for the 22-23 school year. And as part of that, we do need the board to take action to non-renew 34 probationary teachers. These teachers would have, would have are being non-renewed due to reduction in positions, some licensure issues, uh, performance, making room for leaves of absence returns, things such as that. There are a number of these teachers that are likely going to be rehired, especially those that are being non-renewed for license uh, reasons. Sometimes we have to do some posting and then rehiring. Um, but in any event, I would ask you to pass the resolution that's before you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Are there any questions? I have a question. Um, I always don't like doing this process. I understand the why. and the reasoning behind it. But I know like we haven't completely submitted all of the decisions we have for the budget yet and where some of these changes come. And I know it's difficult to say which positions in this list will be coming back, but I know we haven't quite settled. There was some, there was some discussion at the last meeting over, over the band program and the numbers there and some of the other concerns. And it's really hard when I see some well-loved teachers on this list especially teachers I know my, my children have had as well. Um, what Can you give us any direction in terms of where we see with this list of how things could possibly change in the next couple months as we're looking at the budget or is this pretty much kind of said and done? I know it's hard because you can't name individual names right now, but. So well, like I mentioned, there are about a handful, five or six that are we fully anticipate rehiring. It's a license issue. So maybe they were a tier one teacher or a tier two teacher, which means that they have to be non-renewed by statute. We post and then we can rehire them, but you can't rehire them until and ask for a special permission, it's called, till after July 1. So those are just kind of technical mm -hmm. non-renewals and rehires. So there'll be a number of those. Um, and then there are some positions, like we had somebody resign today, and so I was able to take a name off this list. Um, we are likely going to have, I had somebody else resign yesterday, so too late to take a name off the list, but we're gonna post. Likely someone will get rehired. Um, if there are any additional um, budgetary enhancements made, then we can always rehire people. It's. Uh, we have lots of time to do that. It's you have some statutory timelines for non-renewal 
of probationary teachers and also unrequested leave teachers. Luckily, we don't have any of those. Cross our fingers. Uh, well, it's too late to non-renew any um, tenured teachers. But um, So we would anticipate if perhaps we get some additional money from the legislature, you might make the decision to spend some of that money on some of these positions, and we'd be able to post and rehire people. I don't know. Superintendent Berg, did you have some other ideas? Uh, no. And I mean, it, it, there's multiple things that go into this. And, and again, it, I mean, the last year the list was fairly large as well, um, if we remember back. And, you know, part of it is, is, is that, you know, th there's just contractual pieces that we have to go through as well in terms of where people need to be moved. And so there's just lots of different moving parts that go with it. So I fully understand how it works. I just think it is unfortunate that sometimes it's our newest, youngest that are on the, the on the list. It's just the way the system works. And it's something I've never really been fond of. But no, it's not a fun just, process. Just just voicing my concern there. There are definitely some names on here I would completely disagree with. So I think I'm well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Member Saucer. Are there any other questions or comments? All right. Um, seeing none others, can I get a motion on this? Approval of non-renewal and termination of probationary teachers. So moved. Second. Motion by Carrero, second by Simmons. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Uh, that's three in favor, one against. The motion carries, and that ends our administrative actions. Thanks, Marion. Our next uh, set of items is policy actions. Um, who covers? We covered them at the work session pretty much, except for all of them were pretty much changes due to statute with the exception of, which one was it, Marianne? The public records, oh. right? The protection and privacy yeah. of public records. Exactly, we just, yeah. We changed what information was director, directory information, so for more for the privacy of our students. But the rest of them are fairly standard. We went through them last time. If there's any questions, I'm sure Marion could help us with them. But. Those are some motion to carry all of them forward in once. That would work well. Yes. Right. Can I get that motion? So moved. Who wants to read it? <laughs> <laughs> Second. All right. Motion to approve uh, policies 501, 506, 514, 515, 522, uh, 1013, 1014, and 1019. Uh, updates. Uh, motion by. Carrero, second by Saucer. Other way around. Other way around. Motion by Saucer, second by Carrero. All in favor say aye. 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 That motion carries as well. That's the end of our policy actions. Um, last item is uh, board remarks. Last time I, I, I looked at you and then went that direction. Do you want me to wait for you this time? Whatever you want to do. All right. Michael, <laughs> do you want to lead us off? <laughs> uh, no more specific remarks. Just. Uh, Hopefully the weather keeps improving. Hopefully our sports and athletics can kind of get back into business. That's really it for me. I just want to thank board member Saucer for doing an outstanding job on the board and her constant kindness and just a friendly face here. And it always feels like we keep moving. So I want to really thank you for all your efforts that you've done here. And even just being in Farmington, not a part of this board, but prior, just I knew your name just around from just the work that you've done. So thank you. And then thank you to the community as well. That as well. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, do you have any more to add? <laughs> yeah, what they said. No, um, I want to thank our student school board members. I really appreciate the thought and preparation that you put into the updates that we share. I feel like because my kids are young, I get a, a, a better insight into what the high school experience is through you guys. So I, I want to thank you guys. And um, thanks to our administrators and uh, educators who came tonight to share more about their experience. I really appreciated the in-depth discussion around the, co the competency-based uh, learning approach. And that's something that when I got involved in the board and learned more about made me even more excited to be raising my children in this community. So thank you very much. And um, finally to Melissa, I haven't known you long or um, had the opportunity to work with you throughout um, the extensive tenure on your board, but I appreciate your leadership in the, in the first year and coming into this year. And um, similar to what Kennedy said, I knew who you were before I got to work with you. So I wanna wish you and your family the best of luck on your next adventure. 
I'm going to break with the process just a little bit because I'm going to give Melissa the last word on her last. Ooh. Her last. <laughs> so hmm. I'll point at Steve first and then I'll come back to me and then I'll send it back to you. Ditto to everything you guys have been saying. Also, <laughs> Carrie, Rich, Lisa, and Chris, thank you very much for explaining the competencies and also the online. I mean, that's very in depth. Like I said, when we go through the PowerPoint presentation, I struggle with trying to get a, my hand around that. So I appreciate you guys taking your time to do that. And again, like Hannah said, I go, I value you guys' input down there and you guys educate me every day. And it, Melissa's going away party on Saturday. Kennedy kind of, you know, you guys amaze me of, of everything you guys are involved in. And it was a compliment when I said you guys are the high performers on that. So don't take it any differently. <laughs> um, Melissa, you've been a great asset to me. Three, three terms. Wow. Um, this is my second term on the board. Uh, she's been a mentor to me and a good friend. Um, you know, like Jake said, you know, as board members, it's great to agree to disagree. And to me, that's what what makes a good board. Um, and I, her and I have sat down and had great conversation, agree to disagree, but always came across as she understood where I was coming from and she always gave me different perspective that, that you know, my blind spots on that. So I commend you for that. You will be missed, um, like I said, at the beginning of the meeting. Um, great venture for you and your family. Uh, I'm jealous. You know, we moved from Las Vegas here 20, I think it was 25, 25 years ago, and I was scared moving up here. Um, but I'll tell you, I love it. Both our kids graduated from Farmington, and I, I wish you and your family the best. So thank you. All right. So I'll uh, have my, my two words. But honestly, I shouldn't add a whole lot more. We had a, I, I do appreciate this conversation we had tonight about competency-based learning. I, like I said to you, Jason, uh, of the things I hear about since I ran, uh, that, that's been the topic that pops up over and over. And, and, and again, it's the, it's the change from one system to the next. And there's just always that opportunity. My, my, before I was in the job I'm in now, I did corporate communications. And that was a lot of change management. And that's, that's I think, what I... My observation is that's just the, the questions that are popping up are sure fear, but it's also just change and resistance to change. Um, and, and you know, I think we need to continue to balance the, those concerns from stakeholders as they're raised. Um, but I want to hope, I hope that we'll continue to do, um, you know, better jobs through this board, through our own advocacy, um, and through any other channels that we have to continue to bring the community along on important changes like this. It's, 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 it's good stuff. Um, and yeah, Melissa, uh, I know <laughs> uh, I, I first encountered your name because our daughters went to preschool together. And so my wife uh, uh, came home and talked about uh, the saucer kid. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, I think Melissa's running for school board. And that was, that's how long ago that was, right? And uh, you know, my daughter's now, uh, she's 11. And uh, well, yeah, daughters are 11, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I couldn't remember Miriam, I think, just had a birthday, right? They're 11. OK. <laughs> yeah, so they're 11. And it's, anyway, so that's, um, yeah, it's a long time. and, and um, it's, uh, you've been a great friend of my family. Um, you've been a mentor uh, of mine too, as I've certainly as I've approached this and it's been an honor to, to be your friend and to have you as a friend and to, uh, to support some of the things that you've worked for in our community. I think that this um, Farmington Area School Districts are a, is a better place because of the, the, the imprint that you've, you've put on here. So thank you very much for your service. And I'll give you the last word. All right. Well, I did put together a few things and I was trying to figure out the best way to do this and not get too emotional. While emotions are big, I don't want to start crying because once I start, it's gone. Um, but my thoughts to share was to kind of like a recipe of what being a board member means to me and basically kind of outgoing advice to the current board and to any future board member is kind of how I'm looking at this tonight. So my, my words are to be involved. I think of Dr. Geis many times visiting his building. He talks about, and I'm going to paraphrase it wrong, but he talks about students need to touch it, see it, feel it, hear it, and do it. And that's very much my learning style too. And I, everyone needs to experience what they're doing. And without experiencing it, just like the presentation we had tonight at the board table, you get just one tiny glimpse. But it's when you actually take the chance to go in and visit the classrooms, to go on boardwalks, to talk with the teachers, to talk with the parents, to talk with the students and the administrators, and learning the full process is how you learn and how to become so you can be a better advocate for our students here at the board table. And part of doing that is being involved with the professional development opportunities that have, we have here. It's getting to know the opportunities that the Minnesota School Boards Association provides, attending the conferences and the work sessions, and 
not just attending, but being an active participant and getting to know your colleagues from across the state and across the country to be able to share what we're doing here, but also be able to learn what other districts are doing and where you can sh share and improve upon and learn. Um, also in that process is stay on top of the legislation that involves education in Minnesota as well as in the country and get to know your legislators, talk to them, have their phone numbers, bother them when you need to, and also learn enough about our district so that you can be an advocate for them so that not only are you talking to the legislators and saying, hey, we need the cross subsidy fix, which we do, but to be able to be the expert on Farmington and our students so that when they have a question, when there's something that comes up in the committee, that they can reach out and text you and say, hey, if this happens, how will this impact you? And being able to advocate once again for our students and what's best for them at every le level within the government. Also, back to just that personal level is taking the time to be present and be there, to attend the PTP meetings when you can, to go to the performances and the sports and all the different events to be able to learn how our students and our staff and administrators are highlighting and sharing their spark. We saw that tonight and how you can share your spark as a board member with the district and the community. And also a big piece to me has been our strategic plan. Learn it, get to know it, and be part of the process. It is not just a strategic plan that was created in a dark room with 10 people. It was a community plan that was grassroots and continues to be. And be open to experience the history and depth of it and the creation of it and how it can evolve to apply to everyone and to be able to teach it as well. That's been a huge piece. And I remember the first time I met Jason, we were at a strategic planning meeting in a tactics building, tact a tactics committee back in a building we don't even have anymore. I remember sitting at the table with you. But just having those experiences to learn and be part of it. But bottom line, I've already said I think three times, it's about the kids. Remember why you're here. There are meetings and emails and phone calls and letters in the paper that sometimes sour your experience where you sometimes forget why we're at this table and why you chose to be part of the school board and part of the district. Remember, it's about the kids. It's been through all of these experiences and advice that I'm sharing tonight where I found my joy in our community. And I've been honored to have the support for this time here. And I can sincerely thank all of you for this. Thank you very much. Um, I think I just need a motion to adjourn this meeting. I'll make a motion to adjourn at 8 17 p.m. Did you get the second? Second. Motion by Simmons, second by Saucer. All in favor say aye. 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 aye.